All right, it looks like we can get started. It is 6.06. .06. Welcome everyone to the Tuesday, April 13th, 2021 school board meeting. Um, I'm gonna call the meeting to order. Um, let's do a quick roll call. Um, I'll just say your name and if you just say here, that's great. I will start with Eric Joyce, Vice President. I didn't hear you. Sorry, I was having it's okay. difficulties. Here. All right, super. Raquel Alvarez. Here. Mike Blessing. Here. And last but not least, Eleanor Evans. Here. Perfect. All right, we did a roll call. Moving on to item 2B, public report of action taken in closed session. The Oceanside School Board unanimously voted the appointment of Liliana Gordon Gonzalez as principal of Reynolds Elementary School. Super excited. I had the opportunity to work with Liliana as a teacher back in the day, and we're really excited to have her. Um, now we're, uh, that was it. That's all we had to report out on. Um, item 2C, student representatives. Um, I'll turn this over to Julie if you want to facilitate this. Yes, we have our first uh, student representative, Gabby Kimbrell from Oceanside High School. Is Gabby in the room? We're just going to have a moment of technical difficulty and we'll be back with you in just a second. There she is, I see her. Gabby right, Kimbrell, go ahead and unmute. And if you want to turn on your screen, uh, we're thinking that's you that we've promoted to uh, speaker status. Maybe she walked away. Sometimes we do that Maybe. on Zoom. Can we um, promote Tessa Irons from Surfside Educational Academy? So we seem to be having some technical difficulty with our three students, Gabby Kimbrell, Tessa Irons, and Isaias Aguilar. Uh, there's, there's Isaias Aguilar. Good evening. Hi, Isaias. Hi. Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And thank you to board president, Dr. Bigan, and the rest of the board members, as well as to superintendent, Dr. Vital, and her executive staff, and all who are present this evening for giving me time to speak. My name is Isaias Aguilar and I am the ASD president and the student representative from El Camino High School. In the section of student recognition, we have Josue Martinez. Wildcat senior Josue Martinez is being rewarded, rewarded the Dell Scholarship. Dell Scholars received $20,000 as well as personalized multifaceted support for the academic, financial, and emotional life challenges that may prevent students from completing college. They will also be given a laptop with a four-year warranty and other resources to support the scholar and their families. Congratulations, Josue. All of El Camino High is proud of you and your success. We also have Wildcat Junior Aaliyah Anderson, who is on the El Camino High varsity girls basketball team, recently scored her 1,000th career point at last Friday's game against Patrick Henry High School. Congratulations, Aaliyah. Regarding clubs and organizations, March 28th, Sunday, the Sunday before we returned back to school, our El Camino programs, ASB and PALS, hosted freshman tours in the morning in small, in small groups, socially distanced and all masked. We invited freshmen and new transfer students to school to be shown around campus since this would be their first time. ASB has also had a virtual week of activities and spirit days in remembrance of the one year mark 
since we've been on lockdown, which was the Monday of March 8th to March 12th, Friday. And on the Saturday, March 13th, we hosted a virtual pep rally on our school's ASV Instagram account. It was a video collage with performances from our school's talented groups, Cheer, Palm, and ECDC. The week before going back to school, ASB made posters to be hung around school for the freshman tours, as well as posters for all, all of our sports games. Right now, we are excited to be discussing new ideas and projects that we can do now that we are back on campus. We also have Cheer and Palm. On March 15th, Wildcat Cheer Team and Palm Dance Group helped McAuliffe Elementary welcome back their students on their first day of school. And finally, sports. We're happy to share that Sports, including football, cheer, boys and girls basketball, girls volleyball, softball, and water polo, all had their senior night events and their games. Athletes got to walk down with their families and friends. Thank you all for your time, and this concludes my presentation. Thank you. Sounds like a lot of fun things at El Camino High School. Great. Do we have either Gabby or Tessa ready to go? Uh, we do not. Uh, they're not in the room, Stacy. so we can move forward in the agenda. Okay, sounds good. All right, so the next item is 2D, approval of agenda. I'll call for a motion. Move to approve. Do I have a second? Second. All right, we have a first and a second. Any discussion or changes? Nope. All right, I'll call for the vote. All in favor of the agenda? Aye. Aye. All right. Motion carries 5-0. Moving on to item three, the superintendent's report. Dr. Vitale. Yes, President Begin, we have a lot of good news uh, to share tonight and actually needed to prepare a little slide deck so that we could contain all of the good news. So I think Mr. Moon will probably be uh, transitioning our screens to uh, the good news uh, slide deck. And uh, first, I want to invite into the room the executive director of the Boys and Girls Club, uh, Jody Diamond. Jody is going to share a few words with us about the Boys and Girls Club Youth of the Year. Um, the selection is one of our students from El Camino High School, uh, Mansa Ayala. And so uh, Jody is going to talk about her a little bit, and then we're going to watch a video uh, that Monset produced to talk about what the Boys and Girls Club means to her and um, what the impact of this is and what leadership means to her. It's an outstanding video and we're very proud of her. Uh, so Jody, if you will uh, jump on and share some information about uh, the Boys and, Girl Boys and Girls Club, what a powerful and amazing honor this is for Monset and anything else you'd like to say. So uh, Jody, the mic is yours. Thanks so much. Hello, everyone. Good evening. I'm Jody Diamond, CEO of Boys and Girls Clubs of Oceanside. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. I want to keep my remarks brief, as I know that you have a really full agenda tonight. Um, it's been such an unconventional year in so many ways, but we still have extraordinary youth, and we are thrilled to be able to continue the tradition of Youth of the Year. Youth of the Year is Boys and Girls Clubs of America's premier recognition program for club members. To be selected as Youth of the Year is the highest honor a youth member can receive. The title recognizes the outstanding contributions that the member has made to their family, community, school, and Boys and Girls Club, as well as any personal challenges and obstacles they have overcome. I would love to introduce you to our Boys and Girls Clubs of Oceanside 2021 Youth of the Year, Monse Ayala. Monse has been attending Boys and Girls Clubs of Oceanside since she was in kindergarten and is now a senior at El Camino High School with plans to attend Miracosta College upon graduation. It is, a, it is wonderful to be able to share with you this remarkable young lady. So please enjoy this video. Hi everyone, my name is Monse, I'm 17, I go to El Camino High School. I've been a club member for 12 years at the Boys and Girls Club of Oceanside Townsite. The thing I like most about the club is the ability to make new friends and meet new people. I also really like the team group and all the field trips that we go on. It's really great life experiences. 
My best club memory is being a part of the teen groups and doing arts and crafts. My future plans are to go to college, study business administration, and hopefully get my MBA. I hope to get into art and fashion or media because media is at the forefront of the world shaping and influences many people's opinions today. The pandemic has challenged me to be a lot more self-reliant as we're doing school at home now, so I have to manage my hours a lot more carefully. I've also found a newfound appreciation for things that once used to be monotonous, like going to grocery shopping or going to school. Being a leader means to me to be a positive influence and encourage those around me to reach their fullest potential. One of the biggest issues surrounding teens today is drug usage, self-confidence, and comparison. The club provides youth a better opportunity to see themselves in a positive light. I'm so grateful for the club to have provided me a safe place to be at and meet new friends from all different backgrounds. It's true. Great futures start here. Jody, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to come to our meeting to introduce Monse in the video. And we are very proud of you, Monse, and your accomplishments. So uh, Mr. Moon will bring us back to our good news uh, slide deck. And uh, the next slide on the deck is our OUSD Employees of the Year. Uh, first off, we have our Classified Employees of the Year, uh, Regina Basanis, Special Education Paraprofessional at Fusat Elementary. Uh, and eight and a half years in OUSD. Uh, Ms. Basanis is one of the MVPs of Fusat Elementary who cares for all students across the campus. She freely gives of her time to interact with students and support the school in various ways, including making an annual motivation bulletin board and with this year's theme being tough times don't last, tough teams do. And it is beautiful, I've seen it, it's gorgeous. Ms. Basanis will go on as a finalist for San Diego County's Classified Employee of the Year. Congratulations to you, Regina. Uh, our next Classified Employee of the Year is Alan Sanders. Alan Sanders is the lead custodian at Oceanside High School, 30 years in the district. Mr. Sanders is known as a pillar of Oceanside High. He is devoted to all aspects of his work and demonstrates a leadership style that makes others want to work alongside him. He is warm, kind, and dear to all on the OHS campus. Congratulations to you, Alan. Our Teachers of the Year. First, Alyssa Schramm, fourth grade teacher at Del Rio Elementary, eight years teaching. Ms. Schramm is a known advocate for all her students. She builds relationships to positively impact student learning, has a contagious enthusiasm, and continues to develop her powerful instructional strategies. She is a go-to person for her staff and goes above and beyond to support the Del Rio community. Ms. Schramm will go on as a finalist for San Diego County's Teacher of the Year. Zai Sanders, seventh and eighth grade education specialist at Chavez Middle School, 19 years teaching. Ms. Sanders believes that all students can achieve and helps them build upon their unique learning styles. She is intentional in engaging parents and helps fellow staff meet student needs through the IEP process. She goes out of her way to lead extracurricular activities as an, and is an overall uh, leader and unifier among her community. Ms. Sanders will go on as a finalist for San Diego County's Teacher of the Year. Congratulations to all of our employees of the year. Our next good news on our next slide here is a recognition for Eric Franzen as the 2021 Innovative Principal of the Year Award. This award is uh, bestowed upon Eric from the Classroom of the Future Foundation. Eric was nominated by a peer, and this is for Innovation in Education Awards, highlighting champions of educational innovation in the community. Eric will be officially recognized at the 18th Annual Innovation in Education Awards later in May um, at SeaWorld in a hybrid event. Congratulations, uh, Eric, we're very proud of you as well. And our uh, last piece of good news is, uh, and this happened in March, it was a hybrid event and I had the great honor of being able to attend this event. In March, uh, Matthew Jennings, our Director of Communications, hosted the California School Public Relations Association Annual Conference. 
The conference was over the course of two days, Thursday and Friday. And during this conference, our communication team was very pleased to accept on behalf of OUSD, two awards at the highest honor. We received an award of excellence for our Realtor Certification Program and an award of excellence for our community mailer that went to every household. And in even bigger news, Dakota Shelton, our communication specialist, was selected as the CalSPRA Emerging Communicator of the Year. Congratulations to Matthew, Dakota, all of our employees of the year, our student of the year, and this wonderful recognition for um, community members related to Oceanside Unified School District. Thank you, Dr. Begin. Thanks for the good news. Great, congratulations, everyone. Um, all right, moving on to item four, board reports. I'll start with Vice President Eric Joyce. Do you wanna share? Sure, a couple of things that I was able to attend in the last month. Um, the first was the trustee review committee for NICSI, which is our North Coastal Consortium for Special Education. And there are a group of districts that come together to pool services for our students with special needs. Um, they are a, a continuing resource for all of our families. So please be sure to check out the resources they have available on their website at nixie.org. Um, I was able to go to a governance with equity um, training with some of our governance team and looking at ways that we can bring equity lens into our governance um, every day and every month that we um, continue to work on leadership in this district. I was able to attend a SPED parent panel, which was phenomenal, so much great information. Again, some of that information, we, they did a 101 on IEPs, which you know, is an ongoing need for our parents with special needs. I got to watch soccer and football at the high school. Uh, I got to go to a Jefferson Welcome Back to the campus, which was really fun to see the scholars from Jefferson come back on the campus. And uh, some for the sixth graders, some of them had never been on campus before. So they were, they were looking like sixth graders walking into campus. <laughs> and it was really uh, a special event. I got to meet the group that does, uh, the ACES group that does the JMS Motivators. And they get there at 6.30 in the morning for kids that come in before school and do things like Mindfulness Monday. And I think they do karate one day. And uh, they do all kinds of amazing events early in the morning before school starts. So um, if you go to Jefferson, check it out. It's a pretty awesome thing. And then uh, the highlight I finally get to see, another highlight was that I got to see uh, Surfside's campus. And even though the campus still needs some love and, and special attention, and we're working on that, um, I got to see our first children that came back on the campus uh, the, uh, in our child care program. And I got to see a lot of, uh, I got to meet a lot of uh, students who had been on campus for the first time this semester. And they were really excited. And, and I got to hear their teachers sing their praises about how hard they had worked to stay together. So it was a busy month because I had some spring break time, but uh, it was great to see all the great things around the campuses. Thanks, Eric. Um, let's see, Eleanor, would you like to share? Yes, thank you very much. I attended the safe, uh, school safety uh, committee and basically the focus was on um, student, and staff student and staff safety uh, regarding uh, participation and safety during earthquake, if there was an earthquake. I also attended several community um, committee member committee meetings, and that was it. Great, thank you, Eleanor. I'll head over to Raquel Alvarez. Would you like to share? Sure. Um, uh, let's see. I also went to the school safety committee meeting, and just great to see again the communication happening on what needs to be going on with our campuses and and um, the conversations that are happening through there and appreciate all the conversation there. I also went to the governance with equity committee meeting or governance um, with equity um, meeting and it was amazing. It, it, you hear and you understand all the different things that need to happen and, and how we want to make changes sooner than later happen within our school district. And I love that our district is actually at that point of where we are actually are to where we're making changes and hearing and wanting 
to um, be at the top of the flagpole and being noticed for being on the flagpole. I heard that in another committee meeting that I had gone to. And um, I appreciate that within our district and from all of our staff that we have. I also um, went to this parent, the parent uh, support group for SPED and the conversations again for the IEPs. And for those of you that don't know that we do have a support um, group for our parents within um, First Fed, just know that that is out there. And if you don't know, please ask um, Eric or myself or even Dr. Began. We all know um, about the, the group itself and when the meetings are so that we can get you connected because it is an important group to be a part of and some amazing conversations are, are there. and. I went to Jefferson to take a visit and realized how much love we really need to put into that campus. Um, and I'm excited for what we're going to be doing um, as we go and look at what we're going to be doing there to, to make it beautiful and, and inviting for all of our scholars there. And I went um, back to school shopping with a couple of students. You know, CC invited me to go back to school shopping with a couple of our students in, from elementary. and. That was fun because they were excited to be able to be back with their friends and these were students that were already struggling and being back in school and not wanting to go and and being there but with the support of of tc they they felt that want and that desire to be back on campus again so i thank them for giving me the honor to be there to to just see the joy within our students that that was amazing and um i think that's pretty much right i think thank you Wow, you guys have all been busy. Um, Mike? Oh, you're on mute. You gotta unmute. <laughs> I know, I hate that. Really, sorry. What's exciting for me is to hear all you guys talking about um, engaging back on the, the campuses like you all like to do all the time and have been, haven't been able to do because of COVID. And so that's really heartwarming. I know it's a challenging period here. We don't want to get too excited, but everybody is, has a bubbling excitement that we're turning the corner on this thing. And uh, that's, that's really exciting. And that's my message to share to everybody that we appreciate the work that everybody's doing out there and stay safe. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. And I'll wrap it up. Um, I attended a two-way bilingual immersion steering committee meeting with fellow trustee Eleanor Evans. Um, I also did a site visit to Jefferson Middle School before they opened. And yes, Jefferson, the teachers over there had a great conversation with myself and um, trustee Alvarez and really shared some of their passions and their visions for that campus. Um, I also attended the special education parent panel that Raquel and Eric joined and that was super informative and I'm hoping we can continue those. And I just wanted, um, my son started uh, over at Chavez Secondary School and he was very anxious and his first day he managed and everything was new and different, but he figured it out. And I wanted to say a huge shout out to all the teachers, both secondary and elementary for making this work, for you know being flexible with us in the in-person instruction and doing your best in the situation we're in for our students. So thank you. Um, if we have no more board reports, I'll move on to item five, which is general consent items. We have quite a few, and I do know we have a public speaker on one. So I'll call for a motion to approve the general consent items. I'll move approval of consent I'll items second. A through double H. No, Q, double Q. Q. With acknowledgement oh. that item C are being discussed by someone okay. for the public. Thanks. All right. I'll so second. Thanks, <clears throat> Eleanor. Thanks, Mike. All right. Do I have any discussion from the board members? Looking around. Nope. All right. Then we'll open it up to public comment. And we have one public comment. Todd Madison. Hi, All right. Todd. Thanks. Um, do you want me to talk about C and D combined or do you want me to stop after C and do you need three oh. minutes for each? No, no, okay. not at all. Okay, then combine them if you'd like. Okay, and yeah, we'll it'll see. be less than, less than three minutes for both. Okay, great, um, go ahead, Todd. So thank you. Um, so anyway, so on C, great to see all the new hires here. It looks like the district's providing some opportunities for people to work, which is great given the general unemployment level out there now, this is awesome. It was good to see the good news about our support staff a little earlier as well. 
Um, I remember last year we saw a personnel commission report noting the district gets an average of seven fully qualified applicants in every opening, which is a number private industry recruiter would kill for. So that's great. People like uh, coming to work for us. A note on these orders, since finding out last year the district didn't keep statistics on employee turnover, I've been doing that myself. Adding the 13 resignations here gives us a total of 46 voluntary resignations this year with 737 classified FTEs in the adopted budget. That means we have a voluntary turnover rate of 6.24% so far this year, which annualizes out to 8.56. According to ADP, one of the largest payroll processes in the world, the industry average for the education sector is 19.2, which is over twice OUSD's rate. So we have a, a, a very low turnover rate, which is awesome. Must mean people like working here. They feel adequately paid and like it, like it. And thanks to OUSD management for that. Um, so moving on to D, um, similar on there, you know, I think it's, it shows that people like working here. We have such a low number of resignations. Um, four resignations here gives us a total of 20 this year. 918 certificated FTEs means the rate is 2.18%, annualized 2.99%, which is six times lower than the industry standard for the education sector. Um, again, it's a great testament to how much people like working here. And I need to point out, having managed groups of people like this, that it certainly means they enjoy working for the people they work for and that they feel adequately paid. Otherwise, they would be looking for other jobs. Um, so it's great to see that. Thank you very much to OUSD management. Thank you, Todd. With no further public comments, I'll call for the vote. All in favor of Ida, general consent items A through QQ, say aye. 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 Any opposed? No? Okay, motion carries 5-0. That was quite a bit of items. So we're moving on to item seven, student services. And I believe we have a presentation. So I will turn this over to Dr. Vitelli. And I will promptly turn this over to Dr. Lovey and team. And um, I just want to let the board know that we have a lot of information in this presentation because this is before several items that we are asking you to approve tonight. So please know that this will go a little bit longer. Um, so folks at home, get your popcorn, get your soda. Um, but it's really good information. And I think it will really help you make an informed decision on several items that are following on the agenda. So with that, uh, Dr. Lovey and team, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Vitale. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be able to introduce our student services team led by Dr. Jordi Sparks. Uh, since coming to the district, uh, Dr. Vitale has made it very clear the importance of ensuring that we have every support available to our students to make sure that they are successful. Uh, the team has worked very hard in collaboration with uh, leaders across our district, teachers, certificated classified leaders, to really ensure that we are identifying those barriers that may be causing students to not have success and those uh, opportunities that we have to improve our relationships with our community. Um, throughout this presentation, you will see that there are, we hope to demonstrate for you how each uh, facet of our social, emotional, and connections uh, contribute to an overall successful program for our students. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Sparks uh, and his team. Thank you, Dr. Lovey. Just wanted to make sure everybody can hear me okay. If you can give me a thumbs up, make sure I'm good to go. All right. Good to go. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So good evening. Thank you again, Dr. Lovey. Good evening, board president, Dr. Begin, members of the board and superintendent, Dr. Vitali. This evening, you will hear from the student services team, including Maisha Wiggum and Peter Swank, coordinators of student services and myself regarding the work to ensure student support, student safety and student success. You'll hear about the great work of our counselors and assistant principals, how we measure student responses to their attitudes about their own well-being, and how we partner with supports inside and outside of OUSD. You also hear about how we have navigated the challenges of the pandemic to keep students connected and engaged, and how we are thinking about the work ahead of us as we continue to bring students back to in-person learning models. Our aim in this update to the Board of Education is to highlight the ways in which we go about creating the conditions for teachers and school staff and for students to do what they do best, which is to teach and learn. Next slide, please. 
Part of creating the conditions is cultivating a mental health ecosystem, an intricate network of supports, services, partners, data, and care for students that interact with and depend upon each other uh, and on upon each other. This looks like mental, social, emotional intervention and connection, all support. Our approach has been to coordinate with all of our partners in such a way that there's no disproportionate reliance on one resource over the other. And so that our student services team can serve as a liaison and a bridge between the coordination of services and support for our students. So a mental health ecosystem might look like care, mentorship, counseling, crisis support, tutoring, problem solving, and it looks diverse in order to meet our students' diverse needs. Next slide, please. This ecosystem is made up of many parts, resources, people, supports, and services that work together to create conditions for teaching and learning. The purpose of this presentation this evening is to highlight many of the factors that contribute to the ecosystem that support students' social, emotional, and mental well-being so that they can in turn focus on their academic success. This is especially true when students experience crisis or navigate uncertainty or experience any sudden change that might impact their ability to be successful in school. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. We first want to start by highlighting the great work of our counselors. With the addition of elementary counselors in the 1920 school year, we now have 25 secondary counselors, one CTE counselor, and eight elementary counselors. They have been a constant during times of great uncertainty, anxiety, and change. Our social, emotional, and mental health rock for our students, especially in a year unlike any other. They met the challenge with poise, professionalism, and passion to meet our students' social, emotional, and guidance needs. This is the group of our wonderful counselors here. Next slide, please. A true multi-tiered system of support or an MTSS model requires that there be a consistent approach to the academic, behavioral, and social emotional learning needs of students. And that tier one or universal support be available to all students. In our OUSD model, our elementary counselors curate and create lessons to teach the five social emotional learning competencies on a daily basis across all elementary classrooms with students receiving at least introductory lessons and often enrichment lessons on competencies such as social awareness, self-awareness, relationship skills, responsible decision-making, and self-management. At this point in the year, over 2,000 social emotional learning lessons have been taught in elementary schools or elementary classrooms, excuse me, providing a common language across our schools with our students and staff and effectively laying a tier one foundation for all of our students. Next slide, please. Here's an example of a learning outcome from just one of our social awareness lessons in the elementary school classroom. You'll see here that this lesson was about social awareness, specifically talking about stereotyping and how to increase empathy. In this lesson alone, there was a 49% increase of students knowing what stereotyping is, developing that social awareness. And the big piece to highlight here is that there was an 82% increase of students who strongly agree that they know how to practice empathy when stereotypes arise. So again, just an example of the type of SEL lessons that students in K through five classrooms are receiving. Next slide, please. Our secondary counselors, in addition to their own regular in-class guidance lessons, they provide academic support such as guidance counseling, college and career planning, and specifically CTE support and planning. Our secondary schools have an equivalent SEL curriculum that's focused on the five competencies to the elementary version that's available to them. In addition, you'll see that our counselors provide direct student support, social emotional learning. They are true parent and guardian community connections. In addition to the academic of guidance, or academic guidance, they um, are coordinators of care. Over 500 referrals at the mid-year point this year have been made to additional services for students to receive additional support. And 324 504 academic plans exist with 50 of them being initial just this year alone. Next slide, please. 
We also want to lift up the work of our assistant principals. These folks are our child of fine, child fine aficionados. They are the admin on the front line, addressing all issues big and small and communicating, collaborating and conquering alongside the student services team. These are frontline responders. Um, they are an extension of our student services team and we added elementary APs to the mix in the year 1920. We've had great success with working with them as well. One of the many aspects of the assistant principal role is the administration of the Panorama Education Survey, which is our um, social emotional learning universal screener and SEL dashboard tool. This is an opportunity to measure what matters, collecting student responses and perspectives directly from students on how they feel about their relationships with their teachers, their sense of belonging at school, and what their experiences are with the five social emotional learning competencies. Panorama as a tool is new this year, and the first administration was in the beginning of the year when we were all virtual, and the current window is running now so that we have clear data to measure from one administration to the next. Next slide, please. We wanna talk about measuring what matters. APs, again, help coordinate the Panorama Survey Administration. And you'll see here that we have teacher-student relationships and student belonging as the two important categories um, uh, of what we're wanting to measure. Why is that? We chose teacher and student relationships and student belonging because we believe that students who have positive relationships with adults in their school and who feel a sense of belonging in their school community are more invested in their own success and the success of others. Additionally, we believe that for many students, school is a place where they seek belonging and community, and we wanna hear how, they're, how we are doing fulfilling that desire of our students. There are four indicators, and I wanna highlight two. 94% of our students in grades three through five respond that their teacher is respectful to them, and 80% of our students in grades three through five responded that they feel positive sense of belonging at their school even during the time of mostly virtual learning. Next slide, please. Overall measures of teacher-student relationships in grades three through five are at a positive of 82%, with a sense of belonging at 74%. Both of these averages are among the 90th percentile in comparative districts that use the Panorama tool. Next slide, please. The same responses regarding teacher-student relationships in the secondary grades are at a positive of 57% with sense of belonging at 41%. While there's progress, we are looking forward to seeing the second survey administration currently happening now as students have begun to return to in-person learning environments. Next slide, please. In creating this ecosystem, we want to continue to measure the things that we feel are important, such as teacher student relationships and student belonging. We've added a great deal of supports as you'll see throughout this presentation so that we want to continue to measure their impact. In grades six through 12, a couple of the pieces I wanna highlight for you is that 91% of those respondents indicate that their teachers are respectful to them. And overall 54% of those respondents indicated that they feel a sense of belonging at their school. Next slide, please. Uh, Dr. Sparks. Please. I, I, I have a question statement mm -hmm. on page 11 and 12 of the slides where the, um, you talk about mental health grades six through 12, and you're saying that um, it was 43% that students didn't feel the connection and 41% in terms of a sense of belonging. Is this because of the fact of the pandemic and students were not actually physically with their um, <clears throat> instructor or were um, there other factors involved with this? Right, I, I, I'm sure there were other factors involved that were also pandemic related. Um, one of the other slides that were reviewed during this presentation will show kind of what's on the mind and specifically of our secondary students. But in particular here, I would think that a big piece of it is not having the in-person connection of being at school because these this survey was administered in the beginning of the year. And then, um, as, as I share, we're administering the second round of the survey now um, over the next three weeks. And so we'll see a good comparative data with how folks are feeling connected to school versus how they may have felt connected earlier in the year. Okay, will we have a survey done in the fall or? We will, we'll, um, we'll continue. Semester fall. Go ahead. Yes, we'll, we'll continue to administer the survey twice a year in the fall and in the spring. 
And so we're in our current second administration now, and then we'll start a new administration in the fall of next year as well. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, Dr. Spark, can you yes. share how that survey, like the format in which the students took that survey? Yes, so the, the fall survey was administered completely virtually. So students would have done this on their devices. Um, each student in grades three through 12 have a Panorama account that is facilitated by their teacher. Um, and the survey goes directly to them. So they would access in very similar ways that you would access um, iReady or Google Classroom. You log in with your um, student ID, um, with your Google information, and you'd be able to access the survey that way. And it leads you through a series of questions that focus on teacher-student relationships, sense of belonging, and how they feel that they are doing with the five social emotional learning competencies. But it was all done virtually in the fall. It's still being done on a, on a device um, during this administration. Um, and for those who need it, there are um, paper copies available as well. All right, super, thank you. You're welcome. I'm sorry, one more um, follow-up since we're all, since we're in the space, uh, the panorama. So one thing is I appreciate bringing this before the board because, you know, this, this isn't uh, favorable necessarily, but it gives us percentiles on how we compare to other districts. And I think it's important for us to have the conversation, but is this comparing us to districts that had given the survey at the same time, just from a data perspective, if we were all virtual, then it would be a truer data point than if it was comparing us to school districts that had done it the previous year. That's that correct. If you know that. That's correct, uh, um, Trustee Joyce. This actually compares us to districts who administered a survey at the same time that we administered a survey with the fall administration. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for the questions. All right, good to go. Great. So another part of our ecosystem, um, as part of our ecosystem, we've asked all of our partners to measure what matters and to report back to us just how they are doing and reaching our students who have counseling support and therapy needs in order to experience success at school. Wellness Together is one of our great partners established by a major way of influence from the Student Mental Health Initiative from the El Camino High School Student Group. We are in year two of a five-year partnership, which is fully funded through a grant from Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, Wellness Together provides to us four full-time mental health specialists who are either licensed clinical social workers or marriage family therapists, and they provide cognitive behavioral therapy and mental health counseling to students, all coordinated by the school counselor and referred to the school counselor. You'll see here that the four schools that they support currently are Jefferson, King, El Camino, and Oceanside High. Um, we have an over 90% fulfillment rate, which means um, with the 103 students that were referred this year so far, 93 of those students are regularly receiving counseling services, which puts us just over 90% in comparison with other districts whose rates are primarily in the 70s. So we're proud of our partnership and the follow through that's happened with Wellness Together. Next slide, please. question with that, sorry. Please. Um, how do I, how do we identify, because if the students are virtual and they're, we're finding that they have a need, and so how are the counselors identifying the need for the students to be able to get them the services that they, that they offer? Right, great question. Um, students can request um, support, um, that's one way. Also, you'll see um, a little bit later in the slide that um, at this point in the year, we are averaging over 4,000 plus um, daily check-ins with our students, especially in the secondary um, realm between counselors and students. So counselors often have a pulse on what students need, what type of support, and how they might benefit from additional counseling. So if a student is requesting counseling from one of our OUSD counselors, and they provide that service, but they feel they need an additional service, maybe like a tier two or tier three support, additional, maybe longer term counseling, they can refer them to Wellness Together. Um, and the Wellness Together team um, immediately during the pandemic, uh, when we um, shifted schools to virtual last year in March, began their virtual support as well. Um, and they also over time have shifted back to having in-person counseling sessions as well. Then how do the students know that these services are there. So have we communicated to the students of saying, hey, if you need some support or if something's going on, so how do they know that? Because I'm just, I'm, I'm looking at students that <clears throat> I know in our community that, that could use some support, but 
they're not going to openly just go and say, hey, I need counseling, I need to talk to somebody. So how do we reach out and how do we make sure that those students aren't falling between the crack too? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, so there are oftentimes indicators um, for a student, whether they are um, missing a lot of school, they're sharing that there are challenges at home, they're maybe their grades might be slipping, they seem to be maybe withdrawn. There's a lot of indicators that that our teachers, our staff, and our counselors can look for. And oftentimes, just asking the simple question, how are you doing? Do you need some additional support? Do you need to talk? That starts a conversation to where one of our counselors or one of our teachers or one of our admin can there from there see um, what type of support the student might need. So there's indicators that all of our staff are, are trained to look for and to pay attention to. Um, and we also do really encourage our students, especially in the secondary realm, to be advocates for themselves and speak up if they need some sort of additional support. Um, but it still remains a challenge that, um, you know, how do you know what type of support as, as someone needs if, if they're not vocal about it? Um, we also get parent requests. So we will have parent guardians who may reach out to the school and request some additional support. Um, and in that, in that way, we, uh, we filter that through our counselors and our counselors either support them directly or they make a referral to one of our services that we'll be talking about tonight. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Is, is the parent guardian referral, is that uh, formal? Like, can they just call the school or is there paperwork involved with that? There, the, the only paperwork really involved is that there has to be um, uh, permission for students uh, up to a certain age for them to receive the services. Um, so oftentimes, like in our younger grades, um, Palomar Family Counseling or elementary counselors will have to get consent from a parent to um, support their student. But oftentimes in the um, upper grades, um, students can see a counselor or a therapist without that same approval. Okay. And I, can I assume that it's multi-language too as well? That's correct. Yes, they, we have um, both in Wellness Together and several of the other of our partners, which I'll highlight tonight. Um, we have uh, multilingual, bilingual um, therapists. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, I think we are ready to go to the next slide. So it's important for us to not only to know what that students are being supported and served, but also for what purposes and for what reasons. So we ask all of our partners to track this information and to share this information with us so we have a pulse on how students are doing. Um, matching students' needs with the appropriate services and resources is a critical part of balancing our ecosystem. You'll see here, um, that through Wellness Together, the reasons for referral range from worry or anxious mood to sadness to relationship problems to bereavement um, and to potential substance use and abuse issues. Um, so these are um, part of the intake process and we have a, um, uh, an ongoing understanding of what are major challenges students might be struggling with um, when they're going to uh, receive school-based therapy. Next slide, please. Another one of our great partners is Palomar Family Counseling Services. Um, they provide 25 master levels trainees, counselors split amongst our schools. They generally support some of our tier one, but mostly tier two needs. Um, this, this is support that's coordinated again by our OUSD counselor. The counselor at the school site serves as the person who makes the referral, um, but also a parent can request um, this support, but it still goes through our counselor. Um, communication between the Palomar Family Counseling Team and our team in student services and the um, support team at the site, which consists of the admin and the counselor, is ongoing and collaborative. This is something that we work on regularly with Palomar Family. This group in particular um, was responsive and resilient to their reaction to the pandemic. They pivoted immediately and they continued care throughout the summer for any students who were receiving counseling, as well as adjusted their service models to satisfy our virtual demands. Um, you'll see here that up to the mid-year checkpoint, 342 referrals were made to Palomar Family Counseling and 240 students were actively receiving services from Palomar Family Counseling. Next slide, please. Again, just some reasons as to why students might be referred to Palomar Family Counseling service, um, ranging from social issues to safety concerns, family issues and behavioral issues. Um, counselors from Pal Palomar Family Counselors, um, counseling not only um, provide therapy, but they also help students set goals around some of these issues as well. Next slide, please. 
a new partnership that we launched prior to the winter break with the understanding that in addition to experiencing isolation from the pandemic and schools being closed in person learning, winter break we re realized is hard for some people. Additional support being available was important to us. And so we launched a partnership with a 24 seven care concierge or case manager called Care Solace. This provider can directly connect students and their families or staff and their families to a provider of their choice and ensure that they make it to and through the appointment and offered services. Think of this almost as like an Uber for mental health services, getting someone connected to a local mental health service. Um, it's an additional layer of access for our people to get care when they need it and how they need it. Um, this also um, supports the healthcare benefits that um, families might have access to. And um, this can be accessed either through the school where the referrals made from the counselor to Care Solace or students, families, staff, and their families can access it directly um, through a specific OUSD um, partnership um, through a website that they can access to. Next slide, please. This again, just some of the reasons as to why um, students um, may be referred or be seeking out support from Care Solace. Um, what Care Solace will do is once a student or a staff member or a family member answers some questions around um, either substance use disorders or mental health disorders, what insurance they might have. Um, and again, they don't have to have insurance in order to get this service. Once they answer those questions, they're provided with a list of providers in their area that can see them immediately. They can select what language they want to um, their therapist to, to, um, to be fluent in. They can um, do a geographical selection. And the goal with the care concierge service is they help, they help make that appointment for them. They follow up with them to make sure they attended the appointment. And if the referral was made from the school, they follow back up with the school counselor or the school psychologist or the school admin who made the referral to let them know that the student has been receiving the support that they requested. Next slide, please. Pass AmeriCorps is another one of our grant funded and valuable partners who support students at all of our secondary schools and three of our elementary schools through goal setting, accountability, mentorship, and simply living life alongside our young people. They've also demonstrated the utmost commitment to OUSD in trying times, pivoting to support our food distribution last year and this year, as well as through the summer, helping with school reopenings, volunteer opportunities, all the while maintaining their communication with the students who are on their caseload and checking in with them on a regular basis. You'll see here that they've served up to this point in mid-year, they've served 296 students in goals and academics, goals and behavior, and goals and attendance. We believe um, that goal setting is important because effective goal setting leads to long-term success. Past mentors set and help students follow through on their attendance goals and academics, behavior, and attendance. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Transformational Consulting is a small but mighty group that's responsive 24 seven, restorative in their approach with students and families and recognized through any part of the city and in any neighborhood as a support, a connection, an advocate. While students connecting to school, um, while students connecting to school and their teachers and to their counselors remains a critical importance as well as a continued challenge, TC, as we call them, is often the group that facilitates that connection, allowing a student and a family to experience just the right amount of success to know that someone in our organization has their back and is invested in seeing them be successful. This team provides a menu of wraparound services and collaborates daily with the student services team to provide responsive and ongoing support of students and families in need. You'll see here that their support ranges from mentorship, student contact, <clears throat> basic needs support, home visits, and COVID-19 specific support. Just this year alone, over 400 of their students, uh, 400 students in our organization in, in OUSD have been supported directly by TC. We'll talk a little bit more about COVID-19 specific support on the next slide. Next slide, please. What this has looked like for TC to support um, specifically during our time of COVID-19 and the pandemic is on the ground since day one of schools pivoting to virtual and knocking on doors, delivering food, delivering Chromebooks and iPads and identifying hotspot needs and delivering those hotspots to families who need them and more. 
So you'll see here that this has been a group who um, really has done a lot of the groundwork um, in connecting students both literally and figuratively to schools. Next slide, please. Here is just a quick summary of uh, the work of our mental health ecosystem partners um, and our school staff who have contributed to creating this mental health ecosystem. As I shared earlier, our OUSD counselors um, at this point have had over 4,350 daily check-ins with students, <clears throat> regular check-ins that, that they um, uh, do with students um, specifically in our secondary and our elementary counselors. Um, regularly have the SEL lessons, and those SEL lessons continued virtually throughout um, schools being virtual. Um, you'll see, again, uh, the summary of how many students at the mid-year checkpoint have been supported by these respective partners. Next slide, please. So again, just to review what a mental health ecosystem looks like in OUSD, what we're trying to accomplish, our school counselors and school psychologists supporting through social emotional lessons, screeners and surveys, um, safety and intervention and, men and mentoring, which um, Dieter Swank will share more about in a few minutes, ongoing mental health support for students who need that and also by extension their families and wraparound support that includes groups like transmissional consulting, foster and homeless youth supports, which you'll hear more about by Ms. Wiggum and community resource guides, expanded enrichment and secondary learning centers, which we're excited to share some more inf information about this evening. We'll shift now, uh, next slide please, we'll shift now a little bit to talking about the student staff and school safety and um, demonstrating how physical and emotional safety continues to be a high priority for our student services team and for our um, district as a whole. Um, I wanna highlight first, um, next slide please, I wanna highlight first um, the work of our nurses. Um, part of maintaining a mental health ecosystem focuses on the care and well-being of students it is actually the physical care of our students. And to that end, our nurses team is an extension of our student services team. We are nine strong with our nurses. These medical professionals are itinerant and support multiple schools. We added two bilingual nurses <clears throat> this year for a total of three bilingual nurses who speak um, Spanish as their um, second language, or first language, but English as their second. Um, Claire Hudson serves as our department chair and Sandra Wart is our head epidemiology nurse and chief author of our pandemic response safety plan. I'm now happy to welcome Dieter into the presentation. Dieter Swank is our coordinator of student services to talk about additional partnerships and practices for the safety of our schools. Dieter. Thank you, Dr. Sparks. Good evening, board members and Dr. Vitale. During this portion of the presentation, we will focus on our safety procedures, practices, and partnerships. To begin, safety is important because learning environments that support physical and emotional safety are linked to improve student outcomes. Our schools address safety in a variety of areas, including violence, bullying, harassment, and substance abuse. Our recent investments and protocols and practices are listed here. They include a new visitor check-in system known as our Raptor Visitor Management System, uh, a protocol that was developed by our school psychologists to address student self-harm uh, and um, harm to others protocol. We also have worked with Crime Stoppers to bring Students Speaking Out, which is an anonymous um, reporting uh, system that students in middle school and high school can use. We went through all of our campus security assistants and officers went through 24 hours of training during December and January. And we also have a BARC, a new system that's known as BARC, the BARC is an alert system that is computer generated, and these alerts come to us through emails that are activated when certain words or phrases are used within our Oceanside Unified School District Google Suite system. Next slide, please. Our initial step in the safety process is the development of a culture of connectedness. Creating this culture is essential for the development of a community that is safe for students and staff. Next slide, please. 
Oceanside Unified School District is continually striving to strengthen our connections with our community and city partners. Our first partner, our, our first partner of note is the San Diego County Office of Education. Through this partnership, we have recently implemented updated training to our site admin, counselors, and psychologists around best practices to screen and respond to threats. And we brought human trafficking awareness education to our middle and high school campuses. We also work closely with our community nonprofits. This group includes Vista Community Clinic, Boys and Girls Club, Transformational Consultants, Interfaith, Palomar Family Counseling, and North County Lifeline. These groups have provided a variety of supports for our students and families. Examples include rental payment support, assistance in filling out paperwork, medical resources, and academic and enrichment support opportunities. We also partner closely with the city of Oceanside. Examples of this partnership include a city hosted monthly meeting allowing community partners to come together and share information and resources. The city also runs and provides space for a variety of academic and enrichment opportunities for our students. And we also partner with the city of Oceanside to have four school resource officers support all of our schools. Next slide, please. The school resource officers within the Oceanside schools strive to be an additional resource to our students, staff, and families. They do this by focusing on providing a safe learning environment for all, fostering positive relationships with youth, and developing strategies to resolve problems affecting our youth, both in the community and in our schools. The role of the school resource officer can be defined as a triad, including part educator, part mentor, and part law enforcement officer. Next slide, please. Here are a few documented benefits of having school resource officers working in our district. If students have access and familiarity with an officer, they are more likely to report being the victim of a crime to police. Second, officers are able to get an understanding of safety concerns within the community. And because the school resource officers are trained and experienced to work with the schools and youth, school sites are able to work co collectively, collaboratively to overcome issues that come into our school sites. One recent example is a non-student that jumped over a fence onto a district campus. Next slide, please. Sorry, Dieter, before you move on, can you uh, go back to that last slide? Is this, is this research based on, it says research at the top, does that mean it's like we have statistics and data that are, go with this or is this uh, more observational about our district services? <clears throat> These are um, uh, reasons to have uh, uh, officers within schools. I can get um, some of the sources for you where this information came from. Sure. And provide that to the board. Um, that was sort of my question as well. Uh, when you talk about reduction in 9-11 calls. This was done during the past um, year. The, this isn't statistics. Yes. These are over, these are overall um, reasons. They aren't Oceanside specific reasons. And those reductions in 911 calls um, really are about being able to have a collaborative partner within the schools that may that is is knowledgeable about about juveniles knowledgeable about the school system and can collaboratively work to um, to produce outcomes that are more positive 
than they would be if we were just calling into the dispatch center and getting an officer that may or may not have that same level of understanding about our um, system. Thank you. Sure, sure. During the school year, our team, <clears throat> our school resource officer team comprises of four school resource officers. Here are the officers that have been a part of that team this year. Our newest member who's just coming on at this current moment is Officer Jamal Daniels. Officer Daniels attended Oceanside schools from elementary school through high school. Prior to becoming an officer, he has years of experience in working with youth at rec centers. He has a master's degree. We also have Officer Luke Rubish. He has been on loan to us from the neighborhood policing team. Officer Rubish has a bachelor's degree and has been a great addition to our, to our team. I, I think I uh, messed up on that. Officer Daniels has a master's degree. If I said bachelor's, I'm sorry for that part. Our additionally, we have Officer Tiffany Ryder. Officer Ryder was a teacher for 10 years prior to, become, prior to becoming an officer. She holds a master's degree and a teaching credential. She is also bilingual with French as her additional language. Also as a member of the team, we have Officer Eddie Reyes. He is a Marine Corps veteran. He is bilingual with Spanish as his additional language. He works with the Oceanside Police Department training team in de which includes work in de-escalation strategies. As our um, last member, we have Officer Marcus Wood. He was born on Camp Pendleton, graduated from Oceanside High School, has worked many years, worked many years as a football coach at Oceanside High School, has a bachelor's degree as well. As you see these officers, don't hesitate to reach out and say hello. Next slide, please. Here are some statistics for our school resource officers in the Oceanside Unified School District for the 2019-2020 school year. During that time, five students were issued citations for truancy and returned to school. Six students were referred to Diversion. Diversion is a program involving North County Lifeline and the Oceanside Police Department where behavior is addressed through a restorative approach instead of an approach that relies on legal sanctions. During this time, our school resource officers made no student arrests. At this time, I'd like to pass the before presentation. You, before you pass yes. it, um, you said no student received and was ar arrested, but you did issue citations. What becomes of the citation? Is there a record cap? of the students? The, um, <clears throat> the school does not keep a record of that. And uh, my understanding of those juvenile records is that they are at that point a sealed um, piece of information, but I can get more information from our uh, police officials on exactly what happens when that type of a citation is issued. Right, I, I would imagine part of it would be reported to SARMS, but um, again, if, it, if a citation is being issued, it does go somewhere. So you're saying if we're not keeping it, then the, um, Police department is keeping it or what? Th that would be uh, as far as what happens with those juvenile records and, and from that, that police uh, position, that's something that I don't have um, exact information about, but I can uh, get that information for everyone. And I also have another question regarding um, 
the school resource officers, they all seem to have exceptional um, credentials. But I'm curious in terms, are they on loan to us? Do they work for us? How do we, do we share them with um, the Oceanside Police Department? So they are sworn officers within the Oceanside Police Department, and they uh, apply to be school resource officers. The way that that works is there's a portion of the salary that's paid by the school district and a portion of the salary that's paid by the city of Oceanside, by the police department. Um, and there is uh, the, the police department does pick who those officers are, but they take that job very seriously. And the credentials that we saw with these sets of officers are not unique to this year's group or this, this, this group this time. Those are, those are the type of officers that will be coming to us in this program. Um, but they do work for the Oceanside Police Department um, first and foremost. What is the rotation then? Because if you're saying that, that they get selected and they this is the group currently, what is the, the, the time frame? So is it something that they look to stay on? Because I know I've seen a couple of these officers on our school sites and they've been there for some time. So they have a connection with our families and our community, obviously. So is it something that they rotate through or is it something that this is where they want to stay? And so they're here two years, five years, 10 years. What's the time frame? Correct. It's, it is a two-year minimal commitment. And a lot of officers choose to stay for, for um, years longer than that. But the... Um, so, so routinely, we do see officers that have that have a far greater connection than those than those two years. Just to pick up, um, kind of where Raquel was asking too, um, I would like us to think about and moving forward to make sure that we have um, a strong voice in the officers that are on our campuses since it is a shared contract. Um, every, all the ones of our officers that I've met are professional and um, they've been great stewards as far as I could tell with my interactions, but I think it's important that we note that this is an out, outside organization and, and they have kind of a say like two, two people that they're working for essentially. Um, are school resource officers uh, permitted to search students? Uh, if there were that probable cause um, scenario, they would be. Uh, when we have something like that, the probable cause maybe uh, would be like weapon related type things. Um, but they would have the ability to do that. Do we have a strict protocol for notifying parents that a student was searched or seized by one of the SRs? We do have strict protocols for notification when a search takes place on our campuses. Absolutely. It's in board, board uh, policy. And um... If a student had um, a complaint or a concern about uh, school resource officers, where would they take that complaint to? to would they go to a, a teacher? I, I only ask because it is a unique situation because they are not within our organization as an employee. So there's a, a usual a direct line of you know where a parent would bring that concern to. So I, I guess, where would that go? Well, one, one thing that we have within board policy also is the recognition of them falling into a category that's known as a school official. So they do, our SROs do fall under that category. Um, so they would be, they would follow that normal uh, uh, process and investigative um, um, line of any other type of a complaint. And there isn't 
a way just like there isn't a way for a student to receive assistance with with a variety of of needs but any of those reported places whether it were to an administrator to a teacher to a counselor through the more formal places like a uniform complaint or something like that those would be um um investigated and uh taken to the to the to the point necessary for completion i think i, I think i would just ask that we consider creating a, a specific norm or a specific space for that um only because the power imbalance that can be perceived with somebody who is a law enforcement official especially if you know a student's family has experienced um difficult situations with with law enforcement in the past i just worry about um making sure that the students that all feel safe and that they have a safe place to express whether you know if they do not so i, I guess that's it's just like an informal request that we consider that. Um, since they're classified as school officials, does that mean they do anything with discipline? Are they working in the disciplinary? They area? would not be saying any kind of the, the only like the school administrators are the people that would determine uh, those higher levels of, of discipline and it wouldn't be an officer's uh, role to do any portion of that. If there were something that went into the world of, 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 of a criminal type offense, they wouldn't be doing the discipline end, but they may do the police policing end. Right. Um, so Mr. Uh, Swank, let me jump in here. Um, sure. Mr. Joyce, one of the things that um, having been a site administrator for a long time, one of the things that we wanted to continue is for students to know primarily that school is the safe place for the students and that their number one ally and advocate is always the administrator. Um, again, 15 years as a site leader, I had students come to me with all sorts of things and that continues to be the way it is. Our um, you know, we have a really strong administrative team at all of our schools. Our SROs pre predominantly work with our secondary students. Um, and so we do try to keep that way. And I've actually also coached across this uh, county and in many high schools and many times run into um, SROs who they do not do um, the search. They have a much higher uh, threshold in, to search than a school official does. That's school, that is actually the law. But to explain this a little bit better, I have uh, Sean uh, Marchland from OPD who can explain some of these questions. So uh, uh, would you uh, please uh, turn your camera on and if we could have you uh, talk with our board. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, this is Sean. I must have misspelled my last name, Sean Marchand with the uh, Oceanside Police Department. That's, I'm sorry, I was typing on my phone. I'm uh, more than happy to answer any questions you may have. The first question we had was um, about searches and the obligation of the police versus uh, administration. Uh, well, if, if, as far as searches goes, we, we need to notify the parent um, in a school setting. We can't just uh, go ahead and search, search folks not carte blanche without uh, notification of the parents. Um, that may not happen prior to the search, depending on the circumstances. Um, mostly safety, well, it would be entirely safety reasons, um, to be honest with you. Thank you. And then the other question we had was around the citations for truancy. Um, I understand that there's a difference between whether it was um, an elementary student who might rely on parents to get to school and might be challenging, but we have the statistics you see on the screen about the five um, students who are returned to school with the truancy, what happens to those records or what happens to the citation? What is a citation actually? Probably even a better question. A citation is essentially a documentation of what, it, what would be technically an arrest or detention or an infraction. Um, in those cases where it's truancy, uh, that is used basically as leverage for a diversion type program. Um, and with a diversion, program, that criminal record doesn't exist because there's no prosecution that takes place. Great. 
So this is a way for students to be able to be part of that diversion type of program in that could they be eligible without the citation? For a no, diversion I, program? Th there's really no, nothing to be in diversion for at that point um, because no, 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 I hate to use the word criminal because in, in the big, big scheme of, of crime, it's, it's very, very minimal comparatively um, overall. I also heard uh, some concerns about um, the selection of some of our, our folks. Um, I, I, if I could have an opportunity to speak to that, I'd be more than happy to. That'd be great, thank you. Absolutely. So we at the police department understand the relationship that we have with the Oceanside Unified School District. Uh, moreover, uh, the connection that we have with the community uh, through the youth that attend that. So we are very, very particular and selective in who we, we select for this position. It's a position that not everyone is suited for. Um, and we are, like I said, we, we, we are very careful about who we select and what their motivations are. Um, we look for folks that um, have some type of connectivity to the community. Perhaps they have come from some type of uh, diverse background. They have um, a history in education um, prior to law enforcement and really, everybody who participates in um, our school safety enhancement team, their focus isn't on arresting kids. It's on um, safety in the school setting at all times. Uh, it's uh, hard to really quantify. I know that, that there was a desire for some statistics, but it's hard to quantify uh, the benefit of having, we, we have had crimes reported to us by students that would not have likely otherwise been been reported because they see these folks every day they have a they have a connection there and and we don't have like stone-faced officers in there we have people who are actually interacting with staff interacting with students and and, and very participative in in the school setting um, i'd also like to speak briefly about the um the employment piece um, i know there seems to be some confusion or or concern again while our school resource officers are employees of the city of Oceanside and Oceanside Unified has a contract and they're contract employees with Oceanside Unified, ultimately they are police officers. So as such, um, if somebody wants to report a complaint, there's actually probably more venues to do so. Um, if we have a school resource officer that has a complaint reported to us, we will immediately uh, get with the safety team um, with OUSD and ensure that there is some transparency there by, hey, we have a student, we have an issue, and, and we would do what would be necessary to mitigate that issue. Um, if that student made a similar complaint to school staff or administration, my hope is that you would let us know so we can also intervene and, and, and preclude any further, um, hopefully a misunderstanding, but if there's some type of violation of policy or law, we do not tolerate that type of behavior and we would ensure that that wouldn't that would not continue thank you very much we appreciate you clarifying that for us here yeah I know, no problem i know definitely for me one of the things i've worked in schools that have sros and those that do not and one of the benefits that i've seen is um, around the fact that when you have that ongoing relationship with your SRO, when you do um, have a challenge or you do have something that comes up, you have someone who is trained specifically to work with youth who are like children and want to be with kids. And it's always been and there. It's really great to have that ongoing relationship, because if you do not have an SRO connected, then you would have whatever police officer happens to be available, whether they've had training for working with youth or not. So uh, we appreciate that. So thank you very much. A absolutely. And I, I don't want to speak to I, I have a tendency to speak too much. So um, mm -hmm. if you have any other questions, I'll be I'll be available for, through the remainder of the presentation. Thank you so much. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I think our concern is that we really want to break the cycle of um, students going from the schoolhouse to the jailhouse. So this was very informative. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and in that regard, I think that um, I would like to think that we're aligned in that in that manner. We we don't want to see that any more than anyone else. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Sean. Absolutely. Uh, so the only. The only thing uh, left from from our end, my question would be, is if we could get uh, some data cert on a survey of the students' perceptions. I would just love. We're doing. We have lots of great survey data tonight. 
So I survey data on uh, students and families' perceptions, and maybe that, that could be brought back this summer and we could have a full conversation. I wanna say there was a bill passed through the legislature that required us to have conversations about this, but I'm gonna to have to check my ledge tracker. I don't remember <laughs> if it was signed or not. So uh, I thank you so much, Sean, for being here and I to speak directly to some of those concerns. Thank sure. You. Yeah, tr Trustee Joyce, could you um, just take a moment and uh, just uh, what would the what would the question be? Just people's perception of um, officers in the schools, or what was your thought on the survey type question? Yeah, uh, so perceptions of um, school resource officers, how frequently they may interact with them. Um, range of experience when interacting with school resource officers. Again, it would just be good to have uh, the positive data back up some of the, the great um, testimonials that we've heard from community members about school resource officers in the school setting. It's just, I would like to hear student voice when we talk about something that's so directly related to their personal experiences on a day-to-day -day basis. I think right. that one of the questions might be, do, do stu students feel safer? Do they feel safe speaking to the SRO, et cetera? This, we can work on that offline. I'm sure Mercedes, Dr. Levy can help out with that. Good Absolutely. Idea. Yeah, right. we're definitely Thank thinking about that. Thank you. All right, pass it on here to Dr. Sparks. Thank you. Thank you, Dieter, and thank you, Dr. Lovey and Officer Marchin. Um, one of the things I wanted just to add real quick is um, we administer the California Healthy Kids Survey on a yearly basis. Um, some districts do it every couple of years. We do it yearly in Oceanside, and we're able to add questions onto that survey, um, so there's an opportunity for us to do that as well. So good suggestion. Thank you for that, Trustee Joyce. All right. Um, Take a breath, we're gonna shift a little bit and um, talk about connection and engagement specifically through the lens of what has uh, been occurring the past um, 12 to 14 months. Um, <clears throat> what we know is that the pandemic and its challenges, the exacerbating of inequities, um, that OUSD is not immune to the challenges that we read about and hear about on an almost daily basis regarding students experiencing substantial amounts of disruption to their daily academic routines in their daily learning. Um, our response to this has really been focused on three tenets. And the first one is engagement. Um, we want students to want to be here, um, that there is excitement, that there's reason, and that there's purpose. Um, this was true in March when we pivoted to virtual learning over a year ago, and it's true today. Um, we want them to feel connection, that they are connected through either Wi-Fi, through tools, or through relationships. And we want them to feel and experience intentional support that when they disconnect or disengage that someone has their back. Some of the ways that we've done this over the past 14 months has been through a family engagement study team process, which Dieter will share more about in a few minutes, looking at our no-show and drop list. So any students who are on a no-show list or a drop list, we filtered those a number of times, combed through them to conduct home visits on a regular basis, both through our team here and um, student services, our partners such as TC and also our assistant principals at the school sites. Um, our 20 plus absence list, so any students who are hitting that threshold of what the state calls chronically absent, um, those are students who we reach out directly to, either through calls, mailings, or home visits. And um, positive attendance improvement calls has been part of our process as well. Any students who had attendance issues before and have improved, we reach out directly to them to celebrate the fact that they've been showing up to school, whether virtually or in person, on a more consistent basis. And <clears throat> we've enhanced our accept and, and uh, made our attendance procedures more accessible to comply with SB 98, which is the Senate bill um, uh, under which we've been operating during distance learning. And so we understand that there's still challenges that have been exas exacerbated by the pandemic. We still um, have a, a, you know, a chronically absent um, student population that we continue to work at um, and it has been as low as 9% over the past couple of years, and we're continuing to work at that rate on a regular basis. Next slide, please. As a result of the three themes, 
Um, home visits have connected families to school resources like the expanded enrichment program. Several visits have also connected students to needed food, clothing, counseling, mentoring, and ongoing support. And the root of our visits is to start a partnership with the family. We recognize again that the pandemic and its challenges have exacerbated a lot of inequities and that we're not immune to those in OUSD. Just this year alone, we've conducted over 400 in-person home visits. We, since last year, when schools pivoted to virtual, we were able to contact and connect with 99.9% .9 of our students between March and the end of the year. And since March of last year, we've maintained an average of 97% attendance. Um, one of the things you see on your screen here is this information that we typically leave with families, both in English and Spanish, um, whenever we do a home visit. And what it does is it shows families, um, students, parents, caregivers, and guardians, what types of support is available to them, um, whether they need tech support, whether they need resources, and who to reach out to at the district office, um, especially if they're struggling with attendance. Next slide, please. Dieter is going to talk a little bit about um, the way that we intervene when students begin to miss school. Go ahead, Dieter. All right. Thank you very much. Um, our connection and engagement process was created to support students and sites during virtual instruction. And the outreach approach or shift will go beyond this pandemic year. As we will continue to emphasize increasing school engagement, through building a family, school, and community partnership, building upon connection rather than compliance. Our um, personalized outreach efforts began, begin as soon as, as a student has missed three days in a given week. Our initial outreach efforts include office attendance personnel reaching out to families and encouraging teachers to make personal calls to check in. All the while, we look to connect students to resources that will lower the current barriers to regular school attendance. Next slide, please. This slide outlines this approach a little further. Each school site has done extensive work to engage students with school. When the family continues to struggle, we are using an approach we call the Family Engagement Study Team. This approach, um, is a shift from a school attendance review board method to focus on a collaboration, identifying challenges and barriers with families. And now I'll turn it back over to Dr. Sparks. Thank you, Dieter. Go on to the next slide, please. One of the other things we recognize in student services is that the connection and engagement does not begin and end with the student only, but it also includes the family and the community, the parents, the caregivers, and the guardians. To that end, we have an awesome member of our team, Deb Wickman, who is a teacher on special assignment and is also our family and community engagement TOSA. Um, part of her work um, in, in collaboration with the student services team um, and other partners across the, the district and in the community has been to lead 11 parent guardian caregiver academies, 18 parent guardian caregiver sessions with over 400 participants attending. Another great opportunity we had this year was to partner with our local chamber of commerce where they were able to provide during the height of the pandemic um, over $40,000 worth of gift cards to local grocery stores and restaurants which we were able to put directly into the hands of families during food distribution or home visits um, to support not only the families, but also our local businesses. This is some of the great work that the team has done around family and community engagement, thanks to Deb Wickman. I now am excited to introduce to you and bring to you uh, Ms. Maisha Wiggum, who will talk a little bit about um, our expanded enrichment and secondary learning centers. Maisha. Thank you, Dr. Sparks, um, the board, and Dr. Vitali for having me. Oceanside has an existing partnership with ARC, ASAP, the Boys and Girls Club of Oceanside, STAR, and my partner, Marissa Crawford, to provide before and after school enrichment for students. Each program offers unique enrichment opportunities to engage students through self-exploration, tutoring and mentorship. 
This year, our before and after school providers played an important role in phase one of our reopening plan by shifting their expertise in after school programming to provide in-person academic support during virtual learning for our at promise and children from essential worker families. Next slide. The EEP and SOCs have maintained steady enrollment since opening in August. Our providers modified their traditional method of providing ex extended learning opportunities for students to deliver in-person academic support and enrichment opportunities. They developed engaging program plans, hired additional staff, and adjusted their hours of operation to support students during the school day. To support our providers with the transition from a before and after school model, our team engaged in extensive discussions and training to ensure all students have access to the program. To ensure equity, students that are identified as foster transitional receive free and reduced lunch and children of essential worker families had first priority to enroll in the program and are among the 1100 elementary and secondary students participating in the EEP and SLCs. Next slide. The pandemic created an even greater need for additional resources and support for our foster and transitional students. We identify students that are foster and transitional through referrals from the County Office of Ed, our school liaisons, referrals from community organizations, and self-reports from families that complete the transitional affidavit. Our partnerships ensure that we provide social emotional support and resources for students and families to stay connected within the school community. Next slide. Thank you. Ensuring equity and social emotional support of our students are top priority. Our on-site school liaisons provide support for our 58 foster and 53 transitional students to ensure they have the adequate resources to be successful in school. We have partnerships with the County Office of Ed, Shop with the Cop, Assistance League, Promise to Kids, and others to provide backpacks and school supplies, clothes and shoe shopping events and bus passes for students that need transportation to and from school. As the district coordinator, I collaborate with the county on updates and resources available for our school liaisons and foster transitional students. The county provides monthly professional learning opportunities for district and school liaisons to engage in discussions on ways to identify and report foster and transitional students. We also support our students by providing access to technology and free Wi-Fi wi hotspots to increase their engagement in virtual learning, doing home visits and facilitating referrals for community-based organizations that provide wraparound services with food, housing, and individual or family counseling. Right now, we're looking forward to our next event sponsored by the Assistance League for 55 of our foster and transitional secondary students to shop at, uh, for school clothes at Kohl's next week. Um, we recognize that these numbers only reflect our active students in the district that identify as foster and transitional and does not take into account unreported foster and transitional students or students in the care of family members. However, we will continue our outreach and support at the site and district level to ensure we are connecting with our foster and transitional families and providing resources to ensure their success. And now I'm gonna pass it back to Dr. Sparks. I have a question. Uh, yes, ma'am. I have a comment. Hi. Okay. Oh, okay. I, 
earlier in, during our meeting, I heard that art was being dropped by the district or something to that effect, and it was kind of devastating. Um, so the fact that you're involved with the Boys and Girls Club, it was stated earlier that art was not, was going to not be one arc. of the- arc. Arc. We have a great okay. partnership with our ARC providers. Okay. And they are currently serving students at Chavez Middle School in our SLCs. Thank you. Yeah, Appreciate okay, it. you got the clarification. Okay. Go ahead. Um, when we, because we're talking about our foster and our transitional students. <clears throat> yes. This, I have a real passion with these families only, um, and so when we're talking about, you did mention that there are those that are not identified. What do you mean by not being identified or because they're, I guess, not listed as foster? And I know I've, I've talked to Jordy before about it and the difference of this. And I, I, I need clarification. I think our families need clarification because I'm not sure exactly what we need to do because there, there's a lot of foster within our community and they're, um, and what we and so we I think we need to clarify for them of what needs to happen so that they get the services that they need and that they're getting the support that they need because I, I think we miss a lot of the families within our community. So can you um, explain a little bit about that, please? Yes, um, we identify uh, students that are foster and homeless. N number one, primarily is through um, reports that families make to the schools and by completing the uh, foster uh, affidavit, uh, that gives us the information we need um, to pass on to our, um, our foster transitional liaisons. They are the ones that are on the ground um, making those connections with our students and we are fortunate enough to have them at every school. We also have a good relationship with the San Diego County Office of Ed, who also refers students that are foster and homeless to our district, so we can immediately start providing services and support to students. Um, another way that students are identified as foster is through um, court orders that are then shared with uh, each school site. Um, we do recognize that some uh, students that do classify as foster and homeless go unreported because they don't fit into the guidelines of either being um, uh, declared foster students by the court, but they are living in the custody of a close family member. And in those uh, situations, we do our best to provide some of the resources that we have available for our foster students, like access to our uh, expanded enrichment programs or bus passes or free and reduced lunch. Um, those are other indicators. But with our uh, our site liaisons, we really work with them to identify other indicators that would uh, that they need to be aware of that would give us insight on whether a student is experiencing um, being a transitional student. So it's really about building those relationships. You're having conversations with uh, the site administrators and teachers, and um, we're checking in with kids like Dr. Sparks Spark says, we're asking kids, how are you doing? You know, how are things um, going at home? What resources do you need? Um, reaching out to the families. So we're doing everything that we can on our end to make sure that we're making connections with our students and families to ensure that they have the resources that they need. But a lot of our, um, our uh, foster and transitional students sometimes go um, un underreported. Another indicator uh, that was shared um, with the county is by looking at our free and reduced lunch population. So about 5%, 5 to 10% of our students that receive free or reduced lunch may fit into the category of foster and, and trans, uh, foster and transitional students. Um, our numbers this year are, um, are uniquely different because all of our students in the district are receiving, um, are participating in our school nutrition uh, program. So uh, those are just ways that we are doing our best to identify and support students that are foster and transitional. 
a student, is it true that a student uh, could be identified as transitional if they live in a multifamily home? Yes, yes. We, uh, in our district or in our, in our county, um, our indicators are uh, more uh, flexible than, than other organizations' indicators. We do uh, doubling up. We count that as a category. We, uh, any student that does not have a fixed residence um, would be classified as a transitional student. But we do know that other community organizations use different indicators to measure how many students uh, or how their uh, transitional population is measured. But for our district, we do count doubling up in students that live with uh, family members in our numbers. I was just going to point out, I, I'm really interested in making a plan for fleshing out these numbers because the numbers, you know, they translate into the resources for the kids because they bring in additional funding for each child Yes. Uh, from both the federal and the state level. So I'm really interested in making sure we get this righted for next year, especially because I know that we can't affect the numbers for this year, but uh, those are lost resources when we are not able to attain those numbers fully. So. I definitely look forward to working over the summer with the staff to come up with a really robust plan for finding and making sure that our kids are getting what they need. Yes. And according to our CalPADS numbers, they include our active and inactive students because we know that the students transition over time. So they capture uh, our students uh, that identify as foster and homeless for the year. But in my presentation, I captured the students that are homeless, uh, that are transitional liaisons are actively supporting at our school sites. So it's the 58 homeless, sorry, the 58 foster and the 53 transitional. Those are the students that are at our sites and our liaisons are actively connecting and building relationships with. Okay, so so in, in, in having that communication, so are we going to be able to reach out to our families differently that are lost in that in that conversation that are, are not listed as foster the right way or, or we're missing the gap somewhere on how they're how they're in our system because I know like and I know Dr. Sparks and I have talked about because I know with my foster. Um, it's he's a foster but he's not listed as a regular foster so he doesn't receive the services the way a, a foster would within our district and I don't and I don't remember all that and how it all works exactly at this moment but to those that are informal even within our, our community reaching out to those so that we can support them because the communication doesn't always go out to them and so we look at even our transitionals and I was talking with somebody recently that there's a lot of transitionals out there but the fear of communicating and not feeling comfortable with coming mm -hmm. and communicating to our to an administrator or to a counselor or to anybody, but still wanting to be able to give them the services. So if there's a way that we can communicate even to the community as a whole um, to reach out to those families. Is there something that we can do or to work on something over the summer or even starting now so that we reach out to them and give them the support that they need even through the summer through when we're getting ready to go back to school, but so that we have those communications now and in place. So as we're going and finishing out this school year, the students that are within our district know that we're here to support them and that we're here working with them and there's no fear or shame and, and whatever needs that they have. So. Um, and I agree, and we definitely can do more outreach and especially when, um, as we get our students over the summer, to do um, uh, our learning enrichment camps. And over in, in the fall, we know that families' uh, living circumstances have changed you know, during the pandemic. So it's even more of our responsibility to make sure that we're communicating with our school community to make sure that they are aware of the resources that we have available for our students. Like Dr. Sparks has shared, our community has um, been amazing with supporting our families with the $40,000 and um, gift cards were great. Our school lunch programs, um, meal programs were great. Those are other opportunities for us to connect with our community, to let them know that we do have resources for students and families in need. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Maisha, and uh, thank you uh, to our board members for following up with questions about um, ways to support our students who are um, experiencing, um, you know, being transitional, but also in, in, in foster as well. So um, great suggestions, and we are taking notes on those suggestions for sure. So thank you for those. Um, I want to, um, if you could uh, advance to the next slide, please. I want to kind of round out our presentation this evening. Um, believe it or not, yes, it's, it's coming to an end. Um, we'll still entertain questions um, to talk a little bit about restorative practices and restorative places, which have been um, probably one of the top priorities of our student services team, our educational support services staff, um, and by that way, uh, our district leadership. Um, we talked about the mental health ecosystem and all the partners and practices and people that are a part of that. Um, and now we want to share a little bit, just a little bit snapshot of uh, what the impact of that mental health ecosystem um, has, has yielded, um, focusing on how we are fostering equitable, inclusive, and affirming learning environments. So we're going to talk a little bit about restorative practices, which um, is, in short, a non-punitive yet accountable way to approach um, student interaction and student um, discipline. Next slide, please. So a few years ago, um, three to four years ago, um, we made we, we set goals in our department, in the student services department, um, at a high level to decrease our overall number of suspensions and to decrease um, the number of expulsions. Um, we did this because we were coming out of a zero tolerance policy time and we were shifting towards um, restorative practices approach. And our goal was twofold, um, to reduce the suspensions and expulsions, but also specifically to reduce them amongst categories and demographics such as uh, Black and African-American students and our Hispanic and Latino students. We recognized that um, we were not a stranger to the national trend, um, even that uh, Trustee uh, Evans spoke to earlier with um, a, a school to prison pipeline and we wanted to disrupt that. And so this is something that we've been working on intentionally over the past couple of years. And so I'll share here just from the 2718 to the 2021 school year, we've had a 99% decrease in overall suspension events. Um, some of that is attributed to the learning being virtual during the pandemic, but still um, fewer than surrounding school districts, even this year in virtual learning environments. Um, just to kind of snapshot that away from the pandemic year, from 2017 to 2017-18 school year to 1920 school year, we had a 78% decrease in overall suspension events across all of our schools. Specifically, as we look down into some of our demographic data, which we set goals for, we had an 81% decrease in overall suspensions for students who identify as Black or African American. We also had a 78% decrease in overall suspensions from 2017-18 to 1920 for our Hispanic and Latino students. Um, I have to stop and just recognize the incredible work of our um, intervention approaches of our assistant principals and our counselors. They've been a huge part of helping us get to a more restorative place um, through restorative practices. Our expulsions, we had 11 expulsions in the year 1819. We had two in the year 1920. We've had zero since. And that's an 82% decrease in the expulsions from our district. We've set up alternatives such as alternatives to expulsion, alternatives to um, suspension. And again, we've had over 500 of our staff members across the district trained in restorative practices formally, and we'll continue that approach over the next few years. Um, we also believe that these decreases have come about because we've engaged in those social emotional learning lessons, and we've been intentional about leading unconscious bias workshops which we know that bias informs expectations in classrooms. And if we can disrupt some of that, we can disrupt some of the data that we had a few years ago to where we are now. Next slide, please. We recognize though, that we still have significant work ahead, especially as we ret are returning to in-person learning environments. Just this year from October, 2020, students across the county were surveyed um, from our County Office of Ed around what is on their minds. And specifically, you'll see here that students range from mental health concerns being on their minds to distance learning being a challenge for them, them experiencing isolation, um, COVID specific challenges, whether they may have been sick or have a family member or friend who were sick, 
um, resources available to them or not available to them, and the heightened racial inequities that we saw across our nation. And so um, all, of the, all of the work that we've seen with the mental health ecosystem and the work that we've done on our student services team, we recognize that there's still a significant amount of challenges and work ahead. Next slide, please. Dr. Sparks, I'm sorry. Could I have you go back two slides real quick before I lose the train? Um, that first graph says suspension events by race and ethnicity. Could you provide us with this graph disaggregated by um, like rates within our district? So this is these are actual numbers of suspensions, but like a rate per because when you compare these, we know we have you know far more uh, Hispanic or Latinx students than we do Black or African American. And so yes. like comparing a 116 to a 775 number is not as useful. I do like, I love that you gave us those percentages, but if you could have the rates uh, per total students to identify under these race and ethnicity categories, that would be very helpful Absolutely. for understanding. And they've also been very transparent with um, this data, this type of data um, in the LCAP process, because we look closely at that on the LCAP to make um, informed decisions. So I've watched them bring this stuff up. That's wonderful. And just since we're talking about it, another piece um, of accountability and transparency that we, we love at this board, I love that this board shares that as a top goal, um, is creating these dashboards on a school by school basis. So when a, when a parent goes to look and check out their school, they can see what suspensions look like at that school and not have to chase down that data at the state level or any other levels having some of these information come to their to our parents instead of making them chase it would be great. And that's another future project. Great. It's a great, it's a great um, uh, suggestion. And the answer is yes, we can pull that data for you. Um, and I also would be remiss to, to not mention that um, the SDCUA has recognized our reduction in suspensions and, and expulsions. So, We'll um, brag on our team just a little bit here, but yes, we will pull that data for you, and we'll and we can share that with the board. Thank you. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. So, in addition to um, the survey data that was shared from the County Office of Ed, this is countywide California Healthy Kids survey summarized into a graph for seventh, ninth, and eleventh grade students, um, showing over the past couple of years, and this is kind of pre-pandemic things that were on their mind chronic sadness um, and suicidal ideation. And so um, I'm just sharing this um, with you all to say that we recognize and affirm the work ahead and the challenges that likely have been exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, we have these conversations forthright and outright with our counseling teams, our provide, provider um, and partners that we've talked about tonight and all of our admin. Um, and so with the mental health ecosystem, that looks like care and mentorship and counseling and crisis support, tutoring, problem solving, all these things we've talked about tonight. We are confident that we have the right people and partnerships and practices in place to respond to these ongoing challenges and these lived experiences of our students as we continue towards reopening and in-person learning environments. Next slide, please. So on behalf of uh, Ms. Wiggum, Mr. Swank and our entire student services team, I would like to thank you all for your time and to our presentation this evening and for supporting the great work of our team in creating the conditions to where all students can experience support, safety, and success. With that, we will conclude. And if you still have questions, we are absolutely open to those, um, but we really thank you for your time. We're grateful to serve in Oceanside here. Thank you. I don't have a question, but I just want to compliment the team doing, I think, a very outstanding job. Um, it was transparent, a lot of things you shared. I know that other districts probably would not have shared. Um, it was informative, it was excellent, it was very well done and put together. And I'm, we're all looking forward to Oceanside progressing. So thank you again. Thank you, Trustee Evans. Does anybody have any more questions for the team? All right. Well, I don't have questions. I do have a remark, though. Um, I'm going to second almost what Eleanor said, but you all know I'm a data person and 
I love the data. So I thank you all for the information and just being open to accept our questions um, throughout the process of, of going over this presentation. I know it made it a lot longer with us breaking into it, but it just makes it easier not having to go back into it, you know, at the very end of it. So we were, you know, thank you for just being open to listening to the questions as we went along. But again, just thank you so much for the data. And I ask that you continue to share it. And if there's anything else um, that's out there that you can think of that, that we need to change or do differently, please um, just continue on the path that you are because it's amazing. So thank you. Yeah, I would just chime in the same thing. We uh, respect the data that you guys put together and it, and it certainly gives us a framework for dealing with the next four or five uh, or six items on the agenda, dealing with contracts with provider agencies and stuff. And it gives us that on the social emotional scale level and that uh, softer support uh, type um, delivery of services that we, um, that we do. So thank you guys very much for that. Yeah, they definitely built the context. So I'm gonna move us along. Um, to item 7B, um, so we're moving back into business. <laughs> the approval of memorandum of understanding with the city of Oceanside for school resource officers for the 2021-2023 school year. Anybody wanna thank, speak to that? Thank you, Dr. Begin. Um, you had the information about the work of our SROs. This is an opportunity for a cost saving um, partnership between Oceanside Unified School District and Oceanside City and your approval of this will approve the contract for two years to have four uh, SROs available to our schools uh, for those two years. Super. Any discussion, questions? I'm, I'm just gonna speak up because I am going to abstain from the vote because at this time I don't feel like I have enough information. I would like a lot more information about climate and about um, students understanding and all the things we talked about. So I am gonna abstain from this vote. I just wanted to give that reasoning up front. All right. Appreciate it. I'll move approval of the item. I'll second it. I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, motion carries four with one abstention. Got that? Um, let's move forward to item 7C, approval of the San Diego County Office of Ed Countywide plan and OUSD updated plan for serving expelled students. Yes, thank you, Dr. Begin. Again, this is an, a three year uh, approval of the plan. The plan is written by SDCOE. Currently, we have no students who are on the expulsion eligibility. Uh, but again, we wanna make sure that we do have this plan available because it does provide for education for our students should, they be, should a student become expelled. Obviously, we're hoping that does not happen, but it is a three-year plan and allows us to partner with SDCOE to support students. So your approval of this will allow us to have the opportunity to serve students who might otherwise um, not have the opportunity to go to school should they be expelled. Super, do I have any questions for staff? Mm -hmm. All right. All right, I'll make a motion to approve. Do I have a second? Well, in light of the fact that we do not have any students on expulsion, <laughs> I will second that. All right, thank you, Eleanor. So we have a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, motion carries 5-0. Moving right along, 7-D, approval of renewal of contract service agreement with Transformational Consulting, LLC. Yes, this is for our contract for one year with uh, Transformational Consulting. Uh, Dr. Sparks and his team are working on securing a grant that has paid for this uh, for the last uh, three years. We expect to be notified on whether or not we receive the grant um, by May, but this is to provide a one-year contract so we do not have a break in services. And then we will continue to seek out data and uh, feedback from the community about these services each year. I'll make the motion to approve that. I'll, I'll second. second. Any questions or discussion? Yeah, just briefly. TC is a, um, is a group that's filled with people that are highly invested in our community. I, I've had a, the chance to see them in action several times this year doing uh, some home visits with them. And I just, I can't say enough how important they are in creating the long-term relationships that we have servicing kids that struggle, but they know that their TC mentor is gonna be 
on campus and they have this other person that they can go to. Um, so I, I just want to speak to how valuable I've, I've seen their role be during this really unfortunately difficult time. Thanks for sharing. Great. Well, I'll I call do have something still too. Um, with be, be, in knowing and, and the support that they offer our students, they're mostly in our secondary um, levels of, of education. So they're usually in junior and high school, but we know that a lot of the, the needs start to happen in, in the lower levels also. So is there a way to add to the service of being able to get them into the elementary for supports into that part of them, you know, into getting them into elementary as well as middle and high. So um, again, just also seeing everything that they do and the connection that they have. They're usually the first, you know, out there because they have a, a different connection with the community as a whole not just with the students within our school, but with OPD, with SOS. So they, they're, they're on the ground before anybody is usually, before anybody within the community knows what's going on. They're already dealing and helping with whatever the students you know, within our district and their families might need. So looking to be able to have that connection starting sooner than later so that they have that mentorship because with a lot of the, the things that go on with our families here in, in Oceanside, they, they have that connection, not only just while the student is in school, but even after they've left here. So, you know, students that would never have gone to college, you know, wind up in, in colleges and, and getting scholarships and, but still wanting to come back. You know, we have pro football players that are coming back and helping with nutritional services and handing out lunches, you know, but because of, of TC, you know, so they're getting them to come back and still serve in our community because they have those lifelong connections. So I think if we can, get them to support even at a younger and in and in an elementary level i'm wondering if that's possible and then the next question is that can we because i know we're looking at only doing it for one year but if we get the grant can we come back then and decide if it's going to be a three year at that point for these services that we're offering to go with the grant the per, we're paying with grant money Yes, Ms. Alvarez, I'll uh, answer the second question first. Um, absolutely, we can definitely look at it this year, at next year at this time when we would be renewing these grants as well. We would definitely look to see if we wanted to do a one year or a two year. We always have it at the discretion of our district of how long we want to establish our contracts, but considering we are waiting to hear about this, we thought it was most prudent to start with a one year for this time. So yes, that's absolutely an option. Um, the other thing about TC is they do um, spend a, a great deal of time at the high schools generally and the middle schools generally because they're the larger schools. Uh, so it provides them more access to a larger number of students, but they do serve our elementary school students. They do, uh, they have never turned away any, uh, school site request, they go where they're asked to. So while they do spend a lot of time there, um, definitely um, Dr. Sparks has assured me they do go to the elementary schools as well. I guess the question maybe that Raquel ra raises is, is, is there an expansion opportunity here to extend or add additional resources in this year's contract to the elementary level, you know, a half person or something to their team? And this is the first time I'm connecting that a grant is in the in the works, I guess, for them. So is that that's something new now in the grant? Then and, and if we are successful with the grant, the general funds that we would are committing otherwise would be somewhat freed up. Um, so there'd be some additional money to maybe extend to the elementary level. Am I off base there? Or is that possible if the board desired that? Well, we definitely would look into it. So what we'll do is we'll, I'll have Dr. Sparks um, reach out to the school sites and to the principals and the teachers at those sites to see what might be the approach. And then let's look at a design and how that might uh, work with our program. And we can report back to you on what that design and how it goes into the entire uh, system that we have with support. So thank you. And that LCAP committee looks at all the data, Mike? Looks at all the data yeah. from each one of these providers because um, they're all held accountable for what services they provide. So the LCAP committee um, looks at all of that to help make decisions moving forward and recommendations actually to the board. So we'll hear more. What, what is just the grant scores? I'm sorry, I did. Was it, did I miss it in the staff report or is it something new that just? It's surfaced? the same. It's or the same grant. 
Yeah, we've been using that grant. It's Prop 47, um, and we've used that grant for the last few years. Uh, but there is a gap in the funding, so you have to wait about a, a six month part before you can reapply uh, because it is a competitive oh. grant. It's not a grant like a, an entitlement grant like Title One that or something like that. So uh, we think we have a very excellent program. We have great data, and we believe we will get that grant. But again, cannot commit until we do have um, the confirmation of whether or not we have that. Did we pay for prior the prior year's contracts through that grant? Yes, that's correct. Prop, through Prop 47? Okay, yes. thank you. I just missed that. <laughs> Thanks. And Dr. Lovey, you brought up a, a, a plan, like a plan of action, almost like a system, because there were a lot of supports that were brought up in that. And I can imagine how some of them overlap and, um, the, the services they provide are different. So you mentioned stuff like tier two, which not everybody in the school system may not know. It's, it's more than what everybody gets, but it's not so extreme that it's in tier three. With yeah, Are counselors doing tier three uh, mental health services? Is that who we consider our tier three in, um, in that plan? Um, generally not. Um, we would refer the students for more of the tier three um, to therapeutic counselors um, or perhaps our psychologist. Um, what we really feel is our counselors are more at that tier one, tier two level. Um, and then again, when we start to get into more of a therapeutic, we'd be looking for the training is different. Okay. So that's my only concern just this is really kind of on the outside coming in, but if your tier two, tier three providers are temporary, and they're not ones that our, our students are gonna know are gonna be there for them next year, like our on-campus counselors, although our psychologists aren't. So I, anyway, just having that as a factor involved in what we make as a plan, the stability for those students that are, that are experiencing those the most, I think is really important, whether that be TC or counselors that are gonna be on the school site for a long time or wherever we go with it. Um, I've just have heard staff talk about how that stability means a lot. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. If there's no more discussion, I'll go ahead and call for the vote. Did we get a first and a second on that one? I think we did. Yes. We yes. Did. All right. I'm going to call for the vote. All in favor of the approval of the renewal of the contract service agreement with TC. Say aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Moving on to 7E, approval of interagency agreement with the San Diego County Superintendent of Schools for the PASS, that's P-A-S-S, AmeriCorps Gang and Violence Prevention Services. There's a mouthful, go ahead. Thank you, thank you again. So this is another one of our service providers you heard about. These are young people who provide mentorship and uh, guidance to students around goal setting. They are generally young adults who have graduated um, recently from uh, college, kind of a little bit like a Peace Corps, but a domestic Peace Corps. And what they do is they we pay a small stipend to each of them. We have uh, 14 members. And in fact, uh, when I went, uh, went to a training uh, for GLSEN, for our LGBTQ plus um, students, uh, several of our past uh, mentors were actually in the training so that they could better meet the needs of our uh, community. So I was able to meet a few of these young people, um, really a wonderful thing for them to do in a way to, for you know our young people to be able to connect uh, with someone who's just a little bit older and a little bit more experienced than they are. You know, oftentimes kids connect best with someone like that. So this is uh, also another program that we're looking to fund with that Prop 47 should it become available, but until such time for the bridge funding, we wanna continue that service because we do see the results. I have a couple of questions with this. For, for whatever reason in this contract, when we read this contract, it reads like we're the contract fee, not the contractor. And we're paying the um, the workers' comp, and we're paying things like that. Why are we doing it for this group, but not for the other groups that we're trying to get to pass right now? Right. We actually don't have to pay into it. Um, what because they do receive their paycheck not from us, but from SDCOE. It really does go back to SDCOE. Um, so we have not had a claim on from this group in the past, and so it's not likely. So I think it has something to do with the fact, and I can investigate more the actual very uh, technical part. It has to do with the fact that they are a like, um, how can I say, uh, like a, a, a Peace Corps. 
right? So it's not a private, it's not a private group. It's a group that's funded by the government. And basically we're just contributing a grant fund to it. So if it's government, then why aren't they covering the workers? I'm just wondering, because if it, it adds more to then our workers comp. So we're, if we're covering that under us, wouldn't it add to our workers comp? So we're, we're dishing out more money than just what you're bringing to me right here saying this amount of money that we're going to dish out to it. We're also covering them under our insurance, our under workers comp and our things like that. Why are we putting money out to that when it's just kind of if you're, then if we should be doing that for TC, we should be doing that for Palomar, but we're not. So what makes them different than these other groups? Todd, do you want to speak to how uh, workman's comp uh, works? We had a bit of a discussion uh, about that. Can you speak to that question at all? Typically, the district will only cover workers' comp for our own employees. And we file through our, we work with an agency to file uh, our unemployment claims. I'd have to read the contract on this one to see if it's different the way you're describing it. Uh, but typically, outside third-party vendors or um, other agencies that we go into partnership with, we do not pay for those costs for workers' compensation. They're covered by the employer who pays into the system. So unless there's a special arrangement with this, which I'd have to go in and see if there's uh, some sort of legal language in the contract, uh, we would not be on the hook for that. Uh, I've not seen that in the past for any of the outside agencies that we've worked with. I think that's what's confusing because if you look at the contract itself and you look under, even if you look in the compensation costs and repayment schedule, you look at the, the amounts that we're paying out and the way that it works and the, the way that it's worded, it just, it, it doesn't make sense again, because none of the other entities that we're working with that we're doing have anything like that. And then we have a hold the harmless. If we're working with a group that's working with our students, I have a, a real issue with having a whole harmless on a contract that we're looking that we're the contractor, not the contractee, that um, they have a whole harmless on us that states and stipulates that, you know, it, and that it's understood that at all times we're rendering the services described here and, and in a complying with any terms and agreement of OUSD is acting as an independent contractor and not as an officer, agent, or employee of, of SCCOE. Right. You know, so there's a, there's, I, I don't know that we need to be, that we can move forward unless we really actually look at this contract again and understand everything that's in it. Is there an option to push this to the next board meeting and get more information on this? Yes, we can absolutely uh, pull the item. There would be, be no uh, real issues with that. We're happy to bring more clarification back. It won't impact back. services, It will right? not impact okay. services. We could bring it back in May and have that clarification. Uh, we believe it's because it's an SDCOE contract, but let us get the actual answer and bring it back to you in May. Okay. The county it, always cool. loves to do stuff like that to us. <laughs> I do know that they have not billed us for any additional costs, just so you're aware of that. There is, and that has not been the case. Okay. So okay, are we okay, all in so consensus? Can I just make the motion then to, to remove this until, and put it off till next month until we get the data and information and questions answered, please? Second. All right, we have a first and a second. All in favor of Raquel's motion? Aye. 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 All right, so we just made a new motion. So Julie's got her work cut out for her, so this Mercedes. All right, so we're moving on to item 7F and we do have a public comment on this. Um, this is the approval of contract service agreement with Palomar Family Counseling Services for school-based counseling. Yes, so we contract with Palomar uh, Family Counseling to provide at all of our elementary schools and our K K-8 schools and our middle schools to provide that uh, therapeutic uh, counseling through people who are getting their uh, licensure for therapeutic counseling. These are all master's level uh, students who are supervised by full licensed professionals um, around their caseload. And this again would be Prop 47 um, until such time and to continue for one year contract. Do I have any questions? Discussion? Because 
And then I believe we have a public comment from Lisa Turner. Lisa, do you want to join us? Lisa, you can go ahead and unmute and we'll start your three minutes. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm Lisa Turner. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and the executive director of Palomar Family Counseling Service. Um, I just thought I would join tonight to let you know how we've been supporting and strengthening students all year um, through virtual counseling services um, primarily, but also with a smattering of face-to-face -face sessions as well. Our staff has been extremely flexible in um, trying to meet the needs of students and families by structuring their days in very creative and staggered ways in order to, to get students at all different times of day. Um, a few things we've noticed this year is that the number one reason for referral has shifted. It's, it's anxiety is the number one reason. Number two is family problems or family stress. Um, this doesn't match what you would have seen in Dr. Sparks presentation. That's because we updated our tracking mechanism when, since the first time we saw his presentation about a month ago. Anyway, um, but but that's that's current. Family stress is greatly increased. You all you all know this um, financial strain that families are feeling, social isolation, and then just incredible pressure on parents who are doing remote work and then also trying to support their students with virtual learning, amongst many other issues. Um, a silver lining of, de of delivering telehealth services this year has been that we've had significantly increased family contact. Um, with parents, which has just greatly expanded our opportunities to help improve outcomes for the entire family and support the whole family. Um, we're also seeing in lately just both increased comfort with telehealth as well as an increased desire to get back to, to, get back to normal. Um, but the bottom line I think is that telehealth is actually really working very well, even better than any of us anticipated a year ago. I'd like to share one example of a collaboration that happened um, actually in the fall when the middle schools were still completely virtual. At the request of counselors at King Middle School, a, a Palomar Family Counseling, um, Counseling Service therapist created a, a group curriculum for boys and girls to address um, you know, personal skill, skills and building resilience and building um, connections. And um, the boys group was called Fusion, the girls Girl, girls group was called Thrive. Um, after a very productive um, and positive six session series um, ended for sixth grade girls, um, the girls took ownership of this group and decided they didn't want it to end. And they um, continued, they, they started the group on their own and they kept it going on their own, on their own platform. I know one girl took the time to email her, the counselor to thank her for um, allowing her to join the club, as she called it and talked about how, how much it helped her and it gave her a way to interact with others in which she didn't have it. And it was how easy it was to, um, to be disconnected at home, um, just on devices. Um, this speaks, I think, to, the, to students' need for, for belonging and connection at school, as Dr. Sparks referenced in his presentation earlier. We're really happy that we can support this. Um, we are grateful for the continued partnership with OUSD and supporting social and emotional health of students through all of our programming, whether it's through this contract or any of the programs that we run through funding from the County of San Diego. Um, we're very proud to be a part of the mental health ecosystem. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Lisa Turner, for your comments and for sharing that information. I'm going to turn to the board. Um, do we have any more questions or discussion? Nope, I'll make a motion to approve the contract. Super, I'll make a second. All those in favor of renewing this contract with Palomar Family Counseling, say aye. 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 Do, I, do I have any opposed? Opposed. Okay, one opposed. So four, one, motion carries. Moving to the next item, 7G. This is the approval of the 2020 2021 Safe School Action Plans. Yes, uh, so each and every year, we wanna make sure that our uh, schools create a safe school plan. It's a, a mandate and our schools really looked at this very carefully. This is looking at school climate. So do students feel safe um, emotionally, psychologically? The physical safety of the campus. So are things uh, safe on campus? Is there security in place? Are there hazards out of the way? And then the third part is how do we prevent um, 
problems that may occur with safety. So each and every one of our school sites prepared this. And so we would like to have the board uh, accept these school site plans that were worked on by our school sites to address these three areas. Have any questions for staff? I'll make a motion to approve. I have a first and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor of approval of the 2020-2021 Safe School Action Plan, say aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Dr. Lovey. So we are at 8.30 right now. Um, we need to take a 10 minute break. We've been going since six o'clock or even earlier. So we're gonna take a 10 minute break. Um, when we come back, we will be doing item eight. That's the COVID-19 reopening schools in-person instruction. So we will um, start back up at 840. So go take your biology break.
All right. I think our 10 minute break is up. Thanks for your patience. I'll wait for my other board members to join me. All right. We're still missing a few board members. We got Eric, Raquel, and Eleanor will be joining us. We're moving on to item eight. It is 8A COVID 19 reopening schools for in person instruction. We're going to have a staff presentation. Um, we can ask questions for staff, board members throughout the presentation. Um, then we have eight public comments, and then we'll engage in a thorough discussion. So I'm going to turn it over. I'm assuming um, to Dr. Levy to start the presentation or Dr. Vitale. Uh, I will start Dr. Begin and then Thanks. I will promptly turn it over to Dr. Levy. All right. Uh, so Greg Moon will go to uh, our presentation. So this is an update on COVID-19 uh, along with uh, our response and future recommendations. And that presentation will be up, there we are. And so uh, previous board direction as noted uh, on the next slide is that uh, we return our elementary students and they did return uh, on March 15th to a split day hybrid uh, in-person instruction model uh, for four days per week. So that basically means that some students attend in the morning hours and some students in the afternoon hours. And now we've been in, in COVID time, uh, it seems like four years, but it's been one month uh, that we've been in this model. Um, our secondary students returned uh, March 29th um, to a hybrid in-person instructional model. And really they've experienced one full week of that. Then we had spring break and now we're on the second day of the second week of that model. Changes since our last meeting, uh, which was March 9th, um, is that we do now offer in-person hybrid learning uh, at all levels. And I think the slides are just a little delayed, but it'll change. Um, so we do now have in-person uh, hybrid learning uh, at all levels. Uh, there's some new funding uh, that has been uh, allocated and we're going to give you some updates on that, the difference between some state funding, some federal funding, how much we expect to receive, when we expect to receive it, and um, uh, just some big explanations of how that money can be expended. Uh, we'll give updated information on the local case rates. I'm certain that people are aware that as a county, uh, we are now in the orange tier. Um, there were uh, updated CDPH guidelines, which uh, delineated uh, information on sports testing and the number of observers that can be in various venues and recommended three feet of space between students. In addition, I think this was just last week uh, that the governor announced that he expects that the end of uh, our tiered system may end as soon as early as June 15th. So as we continue to move through this worldwide uh, pandemic, we continue to put health and safety and educational outcomes as our focus. And from here, Dr. Lovey is going to share some uh, uh, good news about students coming back that are, that's demonstrated in some pictures. And then we'll give us the various updates as we move through to our recommendation. Dr. Lovey. Thank you so much. Next slide, please. So we wanted to share uh, some photographs of our elementary students um, back at school in person. Um, some of our teachers, you can see students are hard at work. Uh, they're working on mathematics, arts. Uh, they're working on shared reading and writing and just uh, really enjoying being back. Uh, we have a next slide of our middle school students who are participating in outdoor athletics, um, being able to work with a teacher, and again, really working on creating that um, community in person. Next slide. And of course, we have our high school students as well who've been able to uh, re-enter sports uh, competition and training, uh, continuing to work on achieving their graduation uh, career and uh, CTE goals 
And it's been really great to see that happen. So next slide, please. Um, with those that good news, we have more good news around the current situation for COVID-19. Um, currently, this is a slide that tells you about the current situation and the rate of spread of COVID-19 in our community. Um, this graph shows that anytime a the spread is over one person, over number one, which is one person infects one person or more, that means community spread is actually increasing. As long as the number is below one, it is either decreasing or remaining stable. So this is very good news. And this uh, graph is really a, a way to have all of these different important research groups come together for a uh, reflection on what's happening. Next slide, please. And this is San Diego, right? Not specifically Oceanside? Okay. That's San Diego County, yes. Thanks. This is also San Diego County um, data. So this uh, takes into, play, into consideration all the cities and unincorporated areas in San Diego County. This talks about hospitalizations um, and the forecast. So if you see the dotted line in the middle, that's what has currently happened. And if you see the bluish turquoise line, you can see that the forecast of hospitalizations, which is a lagging indicator of COVID spread, is going down quite rapidly. At one point we looked at this and we were up in the hundreds of hospitalizations in January and we're now at 19. So this is very good news about the hospitalization rates um, in our specific county. Next slide. We also wanna be looking at our county case rates. And so you can see that uh, we've held steady at 5.8 per 100,000. Uh, we are now looking at uh, the fact that in almost every one of the 13 indicators, we see uh, green, which means that we are within the tolerances set forward by the uh, county health department for being prepared. And the other thing to look at is if you look at the testing positivity number 10 at 2.5 positivity, that means of all the tests that are given for COVID-19, only 2.5 of them are coming back as a positive case. So that's including both symptomatic and asymptomatic testing. So that's very good news. Next slide. This uh, slide actually becomes the local data. So this is just for Oceanside um, area, Oceanside City. And so what you can see on April 1st, we had a case rate of a seven day with a 3.3 um, case rate, which at one point this was over 50. Um, and if you look in April 7th, we're at 4.10. Uh, statistically, this is pretty much flat. And so this is all good indication that we do continue to see um, a stabilization and reduction in COVID-19 transmission, both, local, both at the county level and at the local level. Next slide. So because of all of these things, we are now in the orange tier here in San Diego uh, County. So with the orange tier, there are um, additional things that businesses can do to open up. Um, larger capacity sizes and venues. Uh, we continue to have a, a lot of mitigation, which continues to be the universal masking. Um, and so those are things to keep in mind. As we do move forward, each of the tiers allow for different um, businesses to open up in different ways. Next slide. We also wanna make sure that we continue as we have had in-person learning. We've reminded families to make sure that what, if your child has symptoms, they stay home that they uh, work to get a test so they can return to school as quickly as possible. Free tests are available for families and that we can make sure that our families are returning to school. This is available to all families, um, both in English and Spanish. You'll see the next one in Spanish. Next slide. As we know, we've had an opportunity in our county, in our state, to have all educational employees vaccinated. That includes our substitutes, our student teachers, those people working in our EEP and second and SLCs. Um, they are all eligible for vaccination. Next slide, please. And this is for our county. So if you look at our county, uh, we know that on the 15th of this month, all adults in California will be eligible to, to sign up to receive a COVID-19 vaccination. And what's interesting on this data is if you look at this uh, dashboard for our county on April 5th, uh, we had about 38.5, or it says 38.5 of residents who had one shot at least. By April 12th, we're at 44. 
percent had one shot. So at this pace, we really believe that by the beginning of May, we'll be well over 50% of our population having at least one uh, shot of COVID-19, which based on the latest research, there is some thought that even with one uh, shot that does help with some of the case rates and spreading. Next slide. We are also happy to say that we continue to provide a robust and expanded uh, program as uh, Ms. Wiggum shared with you, we have over a thousand students enrolled across all of our sites. Half of our schools have no wait list for our programs. Of the schools that do have a wait list, most have fewer than 16 students waiting for a place in our uh, uh, expanded enrichment and secondary learning centers. And as we know, we continuously, uh, as we gain in capacity, we add more students in, or as families say, we don't need this, we again add more students in. So that's uh, one of the things that we want to continue to focus on and provide those services to families. Next slide, please. So as we're looking at this, we are definitely putting our thoughts forward towards summer programming. Uh, one of the things that we know is we wanna make sure that after this year, uh, uh, challenges for our families and our students that we provide a opportunity for them to learn um, and one that will continue. So what we have in the works right now is to have over a thousand students at elementary and a thousand students in secondary school with all sites having on-campus learning with both a three and a six week option for a summer program. Uh, the reason we wanted to talk about a three and a six week option is we know that both families and staff at times uh, prefer to have a shorter session for the summer because it allows for family events to happen. So we wanted to make sure that more kids would be able to participate. Next slide, please. We will have a six hour program at elementary. It'll be three hours of core and math and English language arts and a three hours of a STEAM of a camp enrichment that would be provided by our paraprofessionals in science, technology, engineering, art, music, and physical education. The paraprofessionals selected for this will be paid and receive training in order to provide those services so that students could go to school um, for a six hour program in the summer. It was very exciting to us. Next slide. Uh, Sorry, we Dr. also, Lundy. yes, Mr. Uh, Dreis. Uh, the core ELA and math instruction will be provided by a paraprofessional? Uh, no, the core, okay. the three sorry. hours of core, yes, I'm sorry, I didn't explain that well. The three hour core yeah. math and English language arts are provided by uh, credentialed certificated teachers. And then the three hours of STEM camp enrichment would be provided by our paraprofessionals. Thank you. Thank you, next slide. We also are looking to have bridging programs and all students in the transitional grades would be eligible for the bridge programs that focus on building connections, the social emotional learning lessons that Dr. Spark talked about, helping students become familiar with the campus facility, thinking about study habits and making those connections. So for kindergarten, it would be a one week program offered and for the rising sixth and rising ninth grade, it would be a two week program to allow them to have a nice firm start as they transition from grade to grade because we know those transition uh, levels are so important to getting students started off on the right foot. Next slide, please. Uh, and I will now turn it over to Dr. Norman. Thank you. I get to share the good news about how we'll be able to fund all of these different programs. I'm gonna be going through three different funds, both state and federal, and then at the end, I've provided a summary slide that will take all the information I'm sharing and put it in a nice little package at the end. The first one we're gonna talk about is ABSB 86 legislation. That was enacted on March 5th of 2021. It provides school districts and LEAs with $2 billion of in-person instruction grant, 4.6 billion in expanded learning opportunities grant. It provided state audit requirements, COVID-19 reporting and public health requirements, and the prioritization of vaccines for education staff. In the next few slides, I'll provide, um, I'll be focusing on the in-person reopening grant and the expanded learning opportunities grant. So this grant here, the $2 billion in-person instruction grant, it's also called the IPI grant. Um, districts must provide in-person instruction by April 1st. In-person instruction must be provided through the end of the school year. Um, it's based on our LCFF formula entitlement, and the amount that will be coming to Oceanside is just over $5.5 million. Next slide. 
The $4.6 billion expanded learning opportunities grant, also called the ELO grant, allows for flexibility with implementing learning recovery programs. It's also based on the LCFF formula funding entitlement. 85% of the funds are for in-person support and instruction. 10% of the funds are to hire and retain paraprofessionals. Um, part of the 85% in-person support for instruction can be included there. And then 15% can be used for distance learning or to prepare for in-person learning. The amount awarded to Oceanside is estimated to be at almost $12 million. Next slide. To summarize, um, the two expenditure plans for ABSB 86 funds will be required by June 1st. Funds will be made available to districts in May and August, so we've not yet received any of these funds. And they will be available through August 31st of 2022. Okay, now I'm gonna be talking about federal funding. We have the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Acts. Um, we don't call it CURSA so much, we call it ESSER II. So we've given this another name. The part of that that we'll be receiving in public education is Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. So you'll hear us refer to this as ESSER II. Again, they are federal dollars uh, enacted on December 27th of 2020. It's based on our LCFF formula entitlement. The funds will be available through September of 2023. Our amount is approximately $12.5 million. We have not yet received these funds either. The first installment of ESSER II funds will be made available to districts in May, and they'll be starting off with 25%. So it doesn't come in one lump sum. It will be coming in district uh, distributions, just as AB86 was coming in two different sets as well. Next slide. Uh, the American Rescue Plan. This is elementary and secondary school emergency relief. This is ESSER 3. So we've gone over AB86, we've gone over ESSER 2, now we're looking at ESSER 3. This was enacted on March 11th of 2021. So it's also based on the LCFF formula entitlement. Funds will be available through September 30th of 2024. This amount is a larger amount. It's um, almost 28 million. 20% of the LEA or the district's allocation must be used for learning loss mitigation, and that's approximately five and a half million. And in speaking with the county, they've not been notified yet as to when we will receive ESSER 3 funding. And so what are the different things that we've been asked? What can we use these for? There are different um, justifications is what we call them or allowable expenses. Um, when we're looking at our AB 86, we're looking at cleaning and disinfecting classrooms, PPE, ventilation, other school upgrades for health and safety along with staffing and providing in-person instruction with social and mental health support. When we're looking at ESSER 2 and ESSER 3, there are also similar components with that. Um, we also have addressing learning loss in ways such as summer school. So all of the things that Dr. Lovey talked about, those are things that we can fund through ESSER 2 and ESSER 3 dollars intervention programs, additional staffing, preparing schools for reopening, upgrading projects to improve air quality in school buildings. Um, so those are just some examples of the different justifications that we can utilize um, for spending these dollars. So this last slide, I put it all together for you so you really have it at a glance. It's a lot to hang on to because we're still um, finishing up our timelines with our first allotment of uh, funding as well, which we, commonly just call CARES. Um, so these last three again are the ESSER II, the IPI grant, the ELO grant, and then ESSER III. And when you total these three funds up, it comes close to $60 million. And that's all for the funding right now. Thank you, Dr. Norman. So with that uh, information, uh, we have our staff recommendation with our transition to the uh, orange tier um, and all staff eligible for the vaccination and the other layers of mitigation that we have, such as PPE, student part partitions, our filtration system in every workspace, and our ability to keep uh, staff, teachers, uh, six feet from students. We are recommending that we move our elementary students uh, from the transition of their current model to a five day a week modified schedule to increase in-person time. And we would uh, negotiate uh, what that would look like uh, with our labor, labor partners. 
And our recommendation is, as I stated earlier, our secondary schools have been in this model for one week and two days. And we'd like to stay consistent uh, with this current model um, as it seems to be working uh, with the amount of in-person time that students have had, as this is the first that they've been in school uh, since last March. So with that, we're happy to take uh, any questions on any of those items. I'll open it up. Board members, do you have any questions for staff? Questions or public comment first? You want to... You you want to hear public comment first? Okay. Yes. All right. Let's 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 go ahead and do that. Um, we have a total of eight public comments tonight, unless that's right, Anne. And let's go ahead and pull them yes. up. Anne, do you want to call them up? Todd Madison. And then Heine Ballard. Allison Menu, Elaine Kissick, and then I'll come back and call the other person. Okay. All right. This is um, an important part of the evening, the public comments. So I just wanted, we're happy to receive comments about this item and other issues on the agenda. So thanks for signing up. We, each person will have three minutes to speak. Um, <laughs> so I just wanted to remind people the rules. I know, Todd, you know them. So, <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. We're going to set the timer and go ahead. You're up, Todd. All right. Thank you. So we appreciate the moving of elementary school to five days a week, but of course we prefer a full time schedule as well as moving secondary to the same. Um, we've seen all the timelines presented by the district on things that have been done to deal with the COVID crisis, but missing is the one thing parents have been clear on from the beginning, a plan for full time reopening of in person instruction. Last spring, we saw the district send out the last objective survey of parents we've seen in this entire year. The last survey to actually ask parents whether they wanted full schools to reopen for full-time in-person instruction. The results of that survey were announced in the June 9th board meeting. 53% of parents wanted to return to full-time. 53% is not only a plurality, but a majority. The district and board, of course, ignored this. On July 14th, the petition signed by over 500 parents urging the district to make a plan for full-time return was presented to our board. Ultimately, almost 700 signatures were gathered in support. The district and board ignored this. On July 18th, a group of parents rallied at MLK Park to demand that the district put together a plan for full-time return to school. The district and board ignored this. In August and September, we saw the waiver process introduced. Many parents spoke at board meetings asking the district to apply for these waivers. The district and board ignored this. In September, we saw districts with similar composition to Oceanside Elementaries like Del Mar Union reopen and prove that it could be done safely. The district and board ignored this. Last fall in my board campaign, I stood on almost 5,000 driveways and doorsteps speaking to thousands of people. During various board meetings during that time, I related the hardships of parents and kids were going through. Unlike our board, I had stood in front of them and listened to their thoughts. The district and board ignored this as well. Enrollment has dropped, which will impact future revenue. The district is not providing the education kids parents want for their kids, so they're taking them elsewhere. The district and board have ignored this. We've seen unprecedented dollars flow into our schools, as we've just seen, at over almost $60 million, plus another $20 million for kids that are not actually being educated. We've seen many millions spent, but still no full-time return. And lastly, over this time, we've seen hundreds of parents speak at these meetings, urging the board to listen to them and do what is right for the kids. The district and board, of course, have ignored these parents, instead putting together a partial plan meant to placate its special interests rather than do what parents want, which is what we've seen again tonight. It's nice that elementary school is now on the path, um, just in time for the end of the school year, but what about secondary kids? We'd like to see you make right by your promise to, ju to judge and move quickly to fully reopen all of our schools to the greatest extent possible. Is tonight the night our district and board are going to stop ignoring parents and finally take action to do what parents want? I hope so, thank you. Thanks, Todd. Who's our next speaker, Ann? Hi, Jamie. You're up. Good evening, board members. My name is Jamie, and while I only have one child at South O Elementary, my concern tonight is for kids in all ages at all schools in OUSD. I will admit, until 
last spring when the schools were shut down, I did not pay attention to what goes on in school board meetings. I had naively assumed that districts operated within the boundaries of the law and always put what parents and students' concerns were first and always were looking out for the best interest of the students. And to say that my eyes have been opened is an absolute understatement. It brings to mind a comment or a quote by Maya Angelou. When people show you who they are, believe them the first time. And what I have witnessed in the decisions of this board over the last 13 months has really shown me that I was mistaken that the district had the interest of the students at the highest priority. In the beginning, we all freaked out with the data and it seemed like closing schools was a good idea. But over time, the data has shown that not only is it safe to be in school in person, but it actually is, does more harm than good. The state and county safety protocol requirements should have been an upper limit on making the decisions on whether we return to in-person. But as from what I have seen, the decisions made by this district, they always chose the way that kept the schools closed and kept the children home. It is my understanding as a parent, we elected school board members to represent us as the parents. But as Todd had mentioned, when was the last time you sent a survey out to find out how we as parents felt how we wanted our schools to respond to these changes in requirements by the health department. I've seen the board claim that they care so much about equity, but while they chose to keep Oceanside students home, families who are able to send their children to private schools have been, had the advantage of being in school in person much longer. The data is no longer in your favor. The restrictive protocols are no longer in your favor and money is definitely in your favor. All of these excuses and hurdles that we've been looking at for the last year have been either greatly reduced or completely removed. Full-time in-person instruction, including lunches for all grades at all levels, anything less than that is unsatisfactory to me. And I will not be grateful that you will be returning to us our rights to education that should never have been taken from us in the first place. Actions speak louder than words. I'm done with the words from you guys. Take action tonight so that we as parents will remember this action when we put our votes in the ballot box. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. And can you? Allison, then you. You're up, Allison. I'm trying to get my video here going. Hey, we saw you, there you are. All right, good evening board and Dr. Vitelli. We are now one full year with minimal to no in-person instruction. Our parents are exhausted, juggling work, home tasks at hand and having to be a school teacher to their children. We the parents here at the Parent Association of Oceanside are fed up with the school district's lip service. Sadly, the district and board have seemed to have ignored our children from, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. Seem to have ignored our children from the most vulnerable special needs and all students in the district have suffered enough, struggling with anxiety, depression and suicide, which have all skyrocketed throughout this entire school year. And if that weren't enough, we now see on national news that there was a teacher from a neighboring district bullying students in virtual learning. I trust that this is not happening in Oceanside, but let's get our kids back in school. It's not an issue, it's so that it does not become an issue. The science is clear, students, teachers, and faculty can come back safely. <clears throat> and if we still continue to have parents and students afraid to come back to in-person instruction, then perhaps the board should instruct the district to educate their parents on the safety of schools and use science to show them that it's safe to come back. I am a parent of two young children 
and am saddened and upset that their entire school year <clears throat> has been robbed by a district that doesn't seem to have the, their students' best interest. <clears throat> And so now I will leave you at this and direct it to Dr. Vitali. We'd like to see you make right by your promise to the judge and move quickly and forward in reopening our schools to the greatest extent possible. It would be unfortunate if we were called back in front of the judge to explain why we didn't do what we said we would at our last hearing. Do what is right. Do what is right for our students. They are our future. Thank you. Thank you. Elaine Kisbrick. All right, Elaine. Hi, you're up. Hi. Hi. My name is Elaine Keswick. My daughter, Coral, attends a special education preschool class in the district. I'm very disappointed to see that the board did not include said preschool in the new proposed schedules. I know this is a tiny um, population of students, but each student, including my daughter, is no less valuable. For this whole school year, I have been asking the district to consider the special needs of my daughter. Yet the district continues to ignore my daughter's right to a free, appropriate public education by fully implementing her IEP. Special needs does not mean more important needs, but simply that her needs are very unique because of her disabilities. Her needs require her to have an IEP, an individualized education plan. It contains specific accommodations and modifications, and even a unique class setting with a one-to-one -one aid in order to address these needs. They are needs that are a result of a rare chromosomal duplication called DUP15Q. She is the one in 10,000 to 15,000, my rare bear. Her needs make it so that distance learning is not appropriate. The virtual learning classroom was overwhelming, confusing, and nearly impossible for her to attend to beyond a few seconds here and there. It was the equivalent to her not receiving any education for so many months. I will say again that this has nothing to do with her teacher. It is just the reality of Coral's needs trying to be met by an inappropriate form of teaching and learning. I share this because my daughter, lost hundreds of hours of instruction this year, and it didn't have to be this way. These are hours that all of the surrounding districts were able to give to their SPED preschool students for months now. Just as a comparison, if Coral attended a class in Solana Beach, she would have received conservatively 400 in-person SAI hours this school year. Instead, she has received roughly 50 hours of in-person learning time just because she lives in a different zip code. How is this equitable? This clearly has nothing to do with COVID. The educational code says that districts must offer in-person learning to the greatest extent possible. This means that if it can be done, it must be done. We know it can be done because every surrounding district has done it for their youngest and most impacted preschool students. So why does OUSD think it's okay to ignore educational code and my daughter's right to her education? especially since the district has been given millions of dollars to get kids back in class. I call coral my coral fish because she loves the water. If the world was a water park, she would not be considered disabled in so many ways. But instead, she is growing up in a world that judges her on her ability to climb a tree, expects her to climb a tree and often values her life on how she climbs that tree, but she is my fish. Board members, I ask you to hold the district accountable to presenting plans for all students in the district, especially the ones like my daughter who need to be in school to be learning, especially at this critical time of development. Thank you. Thank you. Our next three speakers will be Elizabeth Leha, Lynn Gonzalez, and Charles Finn. Elizabeth will be first. Good evening. Thank you for letting, good evening. Thank you for letting me speak tonight. I am speaking because I believe the district does not have the children of Oceanside's best interest at heart. Other districts all over the state have been able to open safely. 53% of parents in June notified the school that they wanted full-time instruction. 
This is the last data that the school district has collected. The data is no longer accurate. We need a new survey, but we are past that time. The district failed to do what they needed to do earlier this school year. Students in Oceanside are experiencing the painful loss of peer connections, connections with their teachers, school staff, they're suffering a serious loss of learning and will have lifelong consequences of this learning loss. We may not ever know the full extent, but we do know that our board has a job to protect the education of Oceanside's youth. I'm a parent of three children, an eighth grader who does not remember the names of his teachers this year, a 10th grader who is a three sport athlete, a straight A student, who has no connection with her peers this year, none. I'm also a parent of a senior, a 4.4 GPA student who cannot even stand to talk about El Camino High. She will leave the room if the world words El Camino High School are even mentioned. She feels completely betrayed. My children are fortunate enough that I'm home to support their needs. And I know many others are not in the same boat as me. I'm asking the board to vote to open middle and high school students full time. The children of Oceanside deserve it and their mental health demands it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker, Lynn Gonzalez. Hi, thank Hello. you. Hi, thank you. Um, good evening, uh, Dr. Begin, school board members, Dr. Vitale. My name is Lynn Gonzalez and I've been teaching in Oceanside for 29 years. Throughout the entirety of this school year, a very vocal minority of people, not just in Oceanside, but around the country, have offered up a perplexing idea that school districts are belligerently ignoring their desires to have their children in school. The truth is that school districts have been working tirelessly to provide a quality education while keeping the community safe during a pandemic. These are not normal circumstances by any, any to say the least. Oceanside's elementary schools have already gone through four schedule changes this year all in response to changes in our community's vulnerability to COVID-19. Needless to say, this is quite disruptive for our families. Now the district's administration is proposing yet another schedule change. This time it is not due to changes with the pandemic, but due to a failed lawsuit. The proposed schedule has not been vetted with teachers or parents and is planned to disrupt our families with just 32 days left in the school year. Perhaps most upsetting of all is that the proposal calls for all children to be in the classroom at the same time. It goes directly against CDC and California Public Health Department's strong recommendation that children maintain a minimum of three feet social distance from one another. The plan still contends that teachers will stay six feet away from children, even while having double the amount of students in their classrooms. Let's be clear, the idea that you can have a full classroom of students seated at double desks. All while maintaining three feet of social distancing, it's not even plausible. I urge you to slow this down Parents and teachers need to have input. Decisions of this magnitude need to be collaborative with all stakeholders positions considered. While vaccinations are offering us a bright tomorrow, we are not there yet. Do not spike the football at the 10 yard line. Let us remain with the current schedule and finish out this school year. Let us work on summer opportunities and a fresh start in August. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker. Oh, that it? Yeah. Oh, hi, Charles. Hey. Good evening. Uh, I'm just waiting for somebody to 
hit the full screen button because that'll block out my words that I've written down and I want to be able to see them. All right, your okay, timer well. is starting. All right, good evening, everyone. The district is proposing to return, see now they did it and I can't see my writing, sorry. The district's proposing to return all students to the classroom at once. I have 33 students. The minimal three foot social distancing just isn't possible in my classroom. The principal has been working with me, coming in and measuring, trying to come up with some sort of plan to accommodate 33 students three feet apart with me, the teacher, six feet away. No matter what the furniture configuration, it is not physically possible. So we're looking now at moving some students out of my class for the remainder of the year. That's literally squeezing kids shoulder to shoulder, inches apart. Why? Not because of health updates or new scientific understandings. It's just politics. This is responding to a lawsuit from a few angry but very vocal parents. But when do we get to hear the voices of the rest of my students' parents? They haven't been consulted about this soon to be fifth schedule change of the year. With all the various program changes, I am the third or fourth teacher many of my students have had this year. Now, if our only option is to move kids out of my classroom, some of them are gonna have to be moved and get another teacher for the last few weeks of school. And we need to be honest with the community. These proposed changes won't have a significant impact on the minutes of instruction. They will not increase social emotional support programs and services. These program changes weren't designed to help students, they're designed for the adults. They will make life easier for some of the parents and administrators while placing a burden on classrooms. My fifth graders understand why we do social distancing and they can see through this ridiculous notion that you'll have social distancing outdoors at recess and then pack people into an indoor classroom with no social distancing. I wanna teach my students. I wanna be with my students. I want them to be successful, but I want them to be safe above all. So I'm urging you to slow down this push for putting everybody in the room at the same time. We could accomplish as much with much greater safety just by using our existing schedule and adding students back on campus on Wednesdays. They'd still be in their AB cohorts, not crowded, still socially distanced, but more time and every day at school. Please pause and talk to the parents of all the students and all the stakeholders and find out what we need before you continue. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any more speakers, Anne? No, we do not. Sean Hesfield is not in the room. Oh, okay. So we're going to shift into, let's see if we have any questions for staff. So we'll bring Dr. Levy back up. And I'll turn it over to my board colleagues. Does anybody have any questions about that presentation? The, the bridge program, could you, this is way in the way back. Um, could you explain the bridge program in a little bit more detail about what that looks like? Yeah. It said one or two weeks. I think it was two weeks for, for sixth grade and ninth grade. Yeah, two weeks for the older students and one week for the uh, kindergarten students. It'd be a half day program, um, an opportunity for the students to, to be able to tour the campuses. Each school site would tailor it to their own school site. Um, be able to have opportunities to check out where the restrooms are, if it's at the kindergarten, for them to see where the learning centers are, um, for them to be able to have those kinds of opportunities, meet some of the teachers or, you know, get used to going to the big school, right? And so one of the things that we've always liked to do with kindergarten is to take our kindergarten students as a little tour, like, here's your principal and here's the ladies in the office. So we would be thinking about that kind of thing for kindergarten. And our sixth and uh, our rising sixth and ninth graders would be more focused on what are some of those transitions, especially as middle school, you're going from possibly having two teachers who share their curriculum to having six or seven teachers. So how does one um, approach that? Looking at some of the, um, one of the 
things that I've seen done very well is using some of the AVID strategies, the wicker, um, helping them to understand how to create a binder to keep their uh, materials in order, that type of thing. And then when we are looking at the high school, really looking at that four-year plan. How do we help students to start thinking about what their four-year plan is as they look at um, their college and career readiness? How do they think about what are the courses they need to take and how they can be best prepared for their future. So really it's gonna be all of those things along with some social emotional and getting to know some friends. Um, what we know is that when students do enter, whatever year a student enters into a new school, uh, whether it's a school that starts middle school in seventh grade or sixth grade, there's always a transitional time. And so by giving this support to them, we hope to be able to provide them um, basically a nice runway to start before the, uh, really tight academics uh, happen for them. It'll also be a smaller group for them, so they won't be among all of their peers that time when they get a chance to find their way around the campus. Okay. I have a question about the summer school for high school students um, in terms of being able to earn credits in the core classes or maybe electives. Will that be a, a possibility or are we still planning? It'll absolutely be planning. around. Oh, sorry. Yes, it'll definitely be around credit recovery. Um, and we'll be prioritizing those students who may be uh, struggling to complete the credits needed for graduation. That'll be the priority. Um, again, looking at what availability we have through our APEX system. So one of the things you'll see later on on our board agenda is approving our APEX. That allows students to be able to, um, through independent study, collect some uh, credits and also for in-person instruction for your skills that will also help them with their credit recovery. Now, going back to that bridging program, so if we're going to be having the fifth and ninth graders for two weeks on the campuses, are we also going to have counselors there? Because I know that the students, as they um, made their schedules for the coming year, it, it was a quick change. So parents didn't have any any um, time to, to be involved and to help and to, to figure it all out. So as we're looking forward to the future, again, because we're looking at the CTEs for the, the upper levels, um, are there going to be able to to have communication? Is there going to be assistance for the even the parents that may have questions and to have an opportunity to, to give them that that voice that they would need to at that time? Um, so right now we'd have to look at what I the um, contract is for our counselors. What we are looking is bringing back um, as a voluntary counselors and APs and teachers who want to do that, but it's a great suggestion and definitely something we'll look into building into the program. Question again along summer school lines here. You indicated on that chart a thousand plus students in elementary school and a thousand plus students in secondary school. Can you serve more? Can you serve less? What, or more, more in question, can you handle if there's a greater demand and, and or are, this, are these all pre-selected already where you've got um, kids who need credit recovery and you've identified that or other kids who need it in the elementary level? I mean, 1,000, 2,000 kids out of 16,000 doesn't seem like a lot in this last year of chaos. Absolutely. We also know uh, we have we have really two things going on. Um, one is again not having known what we're having this money so soon, right? So we're going to be also be able to offer a program next summer too. So we fully expect that next summer we'd be able to do even a more robust program. Um, but when we look at this, we are really our constraint really is around um, finding qualified uh, people to run our programs. And what we believe at this time is we, we only want the most qualified, uh, certificated and classified employees working with our students. Um, some school districts that have very large summer programs will maybe go outside of that or not look for those credential teachers as Mr. Joyce was like, please tell me, you know, we're gonna make sure we're using those credential teachers. So what we've done is we've surveyed to see which teachers have interests in working and um, you know, what they're gonna be doing and how we can pay them. So yes, we right now we estimate that with a minimum we can serve a thousand students. Um, so we're trying to balance uh, the human resources that we have available and also the student interests. So we also wanna keep those class sizes um, targeted for students who are looking at credit recovery and for uh, students who may have experienced uh, the deepest learning loss. And of course we will continue with ESY expended 
expanded school year for our students um, with more severe disabilities who may experience regression um, over the summer. Do we have a summer? Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Higgins. Okay. Oh, Terry, go ahead, finish your line. Forget the other line. I'll wait. Uh, no, uh, this is just one. So the on the summer program, are all English learners uh, eligible for summer programming? Yes, they are. And we fund that through Title III. We actually um, had a summer programming last year for them virtually, and they were able to actually get hands-on materials that they were able to take back to their home and work in small groups with uh, teachers. So they, this is actually, um, they are not included in that thousand uh, number. I think last year, I can't remember how many served, but it was a couple hundred, I think, but between 100 and 150, I think. And that's about, uh, I'm testing my math now, it's like 20% of our district, English learners? Uh, no, it's, uh, not high. no, it's not that high. Okay. And it depends on the grade level as well. We have more English learners, um, you know, in our early grades than then they exit as well. So I have a question that was brought up by several public comments. Um, when was the last time we surveyed our parents? Um, they are correct. We did survey in June. Uh, one of the reasons that we actually um, stepped away from some of the surveys is because that's when the tiered, uh, the, L the CDPH guidelines and the tiered system went into place. And when that went into place and the health orders went into place, um, it stopped being um, really we had to follow those orders. And while we were in purple and deep purple, we were not allowed to open uh, any schools in our state. So that's kind of why at that point we felt to continue to ask parents about a choice that really wasn't a choice for them was uh, a waste of their um, time at that time based on it. So that's the reason that we um, stopped that. We did actually though survey at the beginning of the year for those families who did want to go to virtual and stay with virtual. And that's how we uh, established our um, Surfside Academy uh, virtual instruction. So that's why we have about 600 kids in that program for families who were very clear that they wanted to stay with virtual for the entire school year. And does that program have any space right now for more students or because I when, when parents got that choice at the beginning of the year, they were making it not knowing what the future held. None of us knew how long this pandemic would go on and what the trajectory was. So is there a space? We do have some spaces in the program right now. Um, and uh, our principal is working with families and there are some spaces available across different grade levels. Because as people have uh, like you said, not knowing how long it's gone on, made different mm -hmm. choices, different things. We have to, every day our enrollment changes. So there is a possibility that we could survey our parents to find out how many, because we want to have their students back with in the classrooms. We could do that. We could always do a survey of families. I, it would be specific to what we would want to find out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that would be, we would just have to define what was it we were looking at, but we could definitely develop that survey. Okay, thanks. And then I had another question and then I'll let my other colleagues go. So I'm looking at the staff recommendations, elementary return five days a week on a modified schedule. Um, I know that you negotiate that schedule with the practitioners. Um, my question for you is, how are we going to get all those students in a classroom and keep the three foot distancing? So the three foot distancing is a recommendation and the majority of our class sizes uh, at the elementary level are in the range of 24. Um, we do have uh, 20 classrooms that are 30 and above, and we do have a range of classrooms between 25 and 30. Um, so again, it's a recommendation. Uh, we have other layers of mitigation in place, such as filtration, PPE, the plastic barriers, um, staff being eligible for uh, the vaccine. And um, just in some brainstorming that Dr. Lovey did with principals, just in the idea of um, for those larger class sizes and the three foot distancing again is a recommendation. Um, they would come up with different things such as using the intervention teacher um, to pull students from the class as Mr. Finn talked about. Um, yes, there could be another uh, teacher change to try and balance out some classes. 
Um, there could be additional students that um, decide if this is the recommendation that's accepted by the board. Um, parents might not want their uh, students in that situation and that could uh, decrease some of the class sizes. So um, those would be just some of the initial thoughts that come to my mind. So once we know that we're not doing the three foot distancing in those classes, we can ask our parents if they wanna have their students back. Because as board president, I get many emails from many parents, some parents are teachers, et cetera. And I'm seeing an uneven balance of people that really want to adhere to the three foot distancing and feel safe sending their kids back to school. And then I have the other group that just get them back in and put them all in the classroom. So I really think we need to reach out to our families and find out what their preference is. And if we don't have enough room in our Surfside, how are we gonna accommodate these families that don't wanna have their kids in a classroom without that highly recommended from the CDC three foot distancing? Well, what I can say with every pivot that we've made, um, and as noted, there have been uh, several, uh, we've been able to accommodate the requests of our families. Except for the waiting list with the enrichment programs. Right. That, that's been a moving target. And so okay. um, as Dr. Lovey, because I often question about that, um, because our board members often question about that. And what she reminds me is that that's constantly a moving target. So it's not like it's been the same. Uh, say if there's 15 kids on the waiting list, it's not like it's been the same 15 kids based on whatever decision we're making and the change that's happening and the shifting, which we acknowledge has been a lot. We, we completely understand that. And we're all trying to shift with the expectations and the changes in CDPH and literally everything in this last year. Um, so it's been a rolling, moving uh, target, Stacy. It, it hasn't been a, a static list. So we've been able to accommodate as people come and go uh, from the program and their needs change. All right, thank you. Other board members, you have questions? I actually, I actually have a couple of questions. Um, so we're looking at Again, another change for our family. So we're affect, So we're not considering, again, going and asking and doing a survey and how our families are gonna be affected because now we're going on to our fifth, fifth time of change, you know, of, of our schedule changes again with our students and everything and our families trying to accommodate, getting carpools together, getting sitters together, getting everything, which leads me now then to another question too and another problem that our families are having an issue with is because if we offered, when we were in the normal, we had before and after school care for our families. We don't have that anymore. And I'm not understanding why we don't have that for our families. When we know now that there is a need because we have the A, the morning and the afternoon. So our families do have a need. And so we don't, we're not supplying those needs currently. And now we're gonna change it again. And we're affecting our families again on doing another change so and we're not still giving them and supplying and give and supporting them with the things that they need so without asking without reaching out to our families and really knowing what they truly want because we've already, we've obviously been told by multiple people that we're not asking and we're not listening to our, our community obviously that this is what we need to do so we need to actually in, on, in all honesty go out and find out what it is that they need and what they're looking for and how can we serve them better, not just in making sure that their students are getting the support that they need as far as their education, as far as um, the special needs that are getting the support that they need and, and looking and giving in them the support that, that they should have had all along. So can, is there a way and, and how long would it take to get all this into play? So there were a few questions in there. So Mercedes, uh, why don't you first take the question about how we've worked with our after-school providers and how they too have responded to many, many, many changes as we continuously try to meet the needs of all stakeholders in Oceanside Unified. But I know you have information on how they made the pivot and change and some of the limitations of their hours, of their staffing, et cetera. 
Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so uh, first of all, I want to say I've really been proud to work with our uh, partners who are providing uh, these programs. Uh, when they started, uh, you know, they were the first re responders providing those supports for our first responder families. And the program started with maybe we had about 100 or 200 kids in it. And to the t today where we have a thousand students participating. So that's really a great expansion on that. They also have been following all of the CDPH guidelines um, and working very diligently to make sure that they have a safe environment. Uh, while we changed from one system to the other, one a couple of things that became to light. One of those is that uh, the program has a maximum of 30 hours per week that um, they can operate while it's grant funded. When we started to have, um, when we started to have uh, the opportunity to refund, we can expand it. But what we do know is that we do have stable cohort groups, and they also have employees. So students being longer than eight hours with the same person when we were in total virtual, that was one of the limitations. Because again, that person needs to have lunch. They need. They can't work more than forty hours. So as we look at that, one of the things that I know um, our after-school providers have been looking at and already thinking about what might happen, about how they can continue to provide those supports ongoing, should we pivot in our schedule? And could they work lo longer in the afternoon? But one of the things that might impact is be the way that we have a thousand students being able to be served at this time is because we use the same classroom for two groups of students, right? The students who go in the morning and the students who go in the afternoon. If we went to a, you know, that system, we'd have to work out and look at hiring some more people and things like that to provide that same level of coverage. But as Dr. Vitale said, every time we've pivoted, um, people have circumstances have changed and people have had different needs. So we would work uh, diligently to um, address that need using whatever uh, funds and opportunities we have. So those are some of those things that are going on. And you can survey the parents what their needs are mm -hmm. as well. Anybody else have any thoughts or questions? Uh, so one thing I wanted to, to ask uh, for board member discussion before we get to the five days a week and the secondary schools outside of those two decisions. Uh, I would ask that we, we again, look at our students from the equity lens that we've all committed to. Um, we know that the pre special ed preschool model of doing any kind of virtual learning is not an accessible point of education. I think we know that there are certain populations that we can still maintain the safe spaces. And now that we're in the orange tier and by the time we get through these next two weeks, we could very well be in the yellow tier. Uh, I think we need to make action tonight to get those students back into school full time that really, really don't access education when they're at home. So I would ask the board to give direction for two weeks from now that English learners, students that are in mod severe or full day programs, and students that are, um, well, those two groups especially, to in the secondary model where they might not have access to instruction five days a week, to provide them five days a week in person instruction on our secondary campuses. Does anyone else have thoughts about? serving those two groups specifically from an equity lens now that we have resources available, now that we know that we have space and now that the conditions of spread have gotten to a point where we know it's much safer to have students in person. My only concern with that is that what courses are that would they be taking? Okay, and especially in high school and such a uh, diverse and widespread uh, level of courses and, and hiring the instructor for that course. You may have a course with maybe one or two students. You may have a course um, with 24 students. So that's, that's my concern. And along with that, the other thing is um, we haven't ever talked about, and hopefully um, I know we're planning for it. What about those students who they didn't complete the course when they, and they still haven't completed the course so they may need to take the course again, which comes under what retention, how does that affect them 
in terms of being a four-year graduate. I know there's a, Lorena Gonzalez has this bill. And she's proposing that all high schools be fifth year, which um, it's a man, she wants it as a mandate. And of course, it'd be an unfunded mandate, um, which would totally, other than getting ADA, it's just not feasible for us. But again, when we look at high school, especially high school, and even the middle schools, um, we need the instructors, not just, you know, to, to teach those courses. And we need to be able to track those students to those courses. If, if we have a student who's taking AP Spanish, maybe only, like I said, a, a few students. And um, that could be very, quote unquote, expensive compared to to the regular school year. So one reason I bring this up is because a lot of this funding that we got from these different sources is based on our LCFF calculations, which are directly looking at an equity basis. We get more money for the students who are English learners. We get more money for students that um, uh, are free and reduced lunch. So I think we have a responsibility now that we do have more wiggle room in, in our secondaries to provide more to those students. Dr. Lovey, do you have any ideas about how, how we could do that? I know I'm kind of, not kind of, I am definitely putting you uh, on the spot, but if you, do you have any ideas? Yeah. I mean, they're in the mornings, they're also the virtual day. I mean, yes, you can leave it to yourself. So I think the key issue here um, um, that uh, Ms. Evans brings up really is, a different problem than we've had in education before. So up until this point, generally speaking, our biggest challenge is that we had a lack of funding. Um, what has happened is that we have received a great deal of funding all at the same moment, at the same moment as everyone else has as well. So what has happened is this has been a strain upon the human resources available to us. As we know, teachers are highly qualified and trained. They have specific credentialing. And the number of people that we're able to hire um, is somewhat limited. So especially with a six week left in school, we were able to hire those 30 intervention elementary people. And that was a great thing. But again, as we're looking at, if we were to look at secondary for English learners, we could possibly find a, a teacher who might be able to teach one of those period lines, but then it could impact the student's other period lines for them to have it because they're integrated into all their other courses, right? Um, but that's one of the reasons that we have the secondary learning center so that they would be um, on campus for in-person learning. And so that would be something we could look at for like perhaps the English learners. But again, looking at getting the human resources hired, um, do the recruitment. And of course, I'm probably speaking to uh, uh, Dr. Racketeer's uh, idea, but just the idea of that piece and trained and all of those things in place. So I guess specifically for the secondary, the students who are English learners, then their best leverage point would probably be the afternoon when teachers are not, they don't have a line and students also don't have a line of classes there. So um, there is good data for regular tutoring even for regular small group tutoring that, that that supports students. So I would ask the board consensus okay. that we do something to specifically target supports for the English learner population over the last six weeks of school, for us, especially for our secondary. And that could be done on Wednesdays, but for elementary. I, have, um, I do have a question for you that was brought up by one of the public comments. Can you tell us what's going on with our preschool special education students? and their program. Yes, yeah, so one of the things that we have with special education in preschool is we actually run into two things. One, the fact that they're young and so they already have class size maxes and that they also have a program. So we have two different programs. We have a four day a week program in, in pre-COVID time. We have a four day a week program and which is for our students who have um, the most, uh, are most impacted by their disabilities. And we have a two week a two day a week program for students who have less impact um, in special education. And we also have our state preschool. Um, and they all tend to share the same facilities because we really believe in making sure we have as many opportunities for the students to work with typical peers and to have inclusion. 
And so I know I've been working with uh, our team to look at each school site and to see how much space they have, um, because again, they also need to have a certain number of toys and a certain number of space for them to work with. So we are looking at which sites we could be able to expand it and see um, how we can make sure that we provide them with that education in a safe manner. Um, the enrollments are pretty high um, because they've always done half days. So it's like 20 in the morning and 20 already in the afternoon. So this, that's why when we split it, it doesn't split the same way because we're really talking 40 enrolled with one teacher. So that's kind of some of the challenges that we have going on. So we are looking at um, expanding the in-person instruction as as can. for as the preschool yes. coming up. Okay, before the end of the school year. That's what we're, we're definitely at. working to find every way we can bring them back as much as possible. All right, super. So, well, I have I have a list of things that I just want to throw out there with my fellow board members. I, I'm really concerned about student health and safety. There's no way we can do the three foot distancing. I'm not comfortable as a parent putting my kid in a school without the three foot distancing, even with the mitigation that's in place. I, I'm worried, I read the news about the emerging COVID variants. The science, I pay attention to that. We are watching the data in San Diego County and specifically for Oceanside. But what I'm reading about these new COVID variants with our young students, young children, our secondary students being infected and possibly hospitalized is scary and there's not enough information yet. I, I find a lot of these schedule changes for elementary this is the fourth or fifth, if you looked at how many times we pivoted, um, they're disruptive. They're super disruptive to schedules. I mean, this pandemic has been completely inconvenient for everyone, right? <laughs> I mean, to be honest with you, but we've gotten through it, but it's super disruptive, not only for the parents and their schedule and their work schedules, but also to the learning environment in the classroom. So it's impacting students, teachers, and families. People have settled into a rhythm. The elementary teachers and the elementary parents that I've spoken to with this AM PM schedule were a little off guard in the beginning, but they've made it work. They have their carpools, they're working together, they have their students in the after school program. They're they are making it work and they're they're going. They've been doing it for a month. I haven't had any complaints as a board member in an email about the AM PM hybrid schedule that we have right now, four days a week, which is great. Um, I just think it's super disruptive to change the schedules. I can't imagine being a teacher right now and having to redo the lesson planning once again with how we deliver instruction, but they'll do it, they'll make it happen. I'm worried about the class sizes. So right now, elementary or secondary, you only have half the students in there. This is something we've always begged for is smaller class sizes so we can individualize instruction for our students, especially their social emotional learning needs. Um, right now, the teacher has half the kids in the class. They're able to connect with them on a one-to-one -one basis, work with them, and then they get the other batch. So it's working. I'm also worried about all the support services that we learned about earlier tonight, which are great, right, for the social emotional supports but all of that is coordinated. Those are schedules. Everything's gonna just get pushed into chaos. When we look at the special ed scheduling that goes in when they're working, the PE, the library, the counselors, I can go on. But th that part, I think we're rushing it too quickly. So I know we've been really careful as we've gone through these pivots or phases of reopening. And it's important that we continue this journey to reopen but we have some obstacles in our way. And I think the other board members have brought up several of them. I would really like to see us continue to reopen gradually, but I think we need to talk to our parents first. And I think we need to consult with the County Public Health Department to make sure that this highly recommended three foot distancing is actually safe for our students, families and staff. So that, that was my two cents. I, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go back before we go on to vote on this. Um, I'm asking for students that are in mod severe classes to be given access to instruction 
five days a week that are not attending a block schedule where they're going to all, all those classes. This is another, the equity thing I'm asking for yeses and nos from everybody because- Can this I, be done? And are you talking secondary or elementary, Eric? I'm just asking for clarity. I, I understand. Uh, it would be all, so uh, it would be all on an equity it's basis. Very earlier. So when you I'm talk sorry, about additional, all? Uh, so when you talk about additional support, um, that can be offered at the secondary level, regardless of what classes. So you talk about tutoring programs. Could we look at um, paying teachers, for example, to tutor kids after school or look at other possibilities um, to specifically support the populations that you mentioned? That would be a yes on that. We could look at that and probably create something we would need to uh, see if we have the workforce that would be willing to do that. Um, and at the elementary level, remember, we do have uh, two intervention teachers who are uh, allocated, uh, Mercedes, correct, at every uh, elementary school. And they're working with the populations most, um, I would say, probably recommended by their teachers. Uh, specifically, I'm certain that many of them are EL and or mod severe. So that's something we already have in place at the elementary. And yes, we could build the, the issue at the secondary level, um, Eric, with saying we want them back um, five days is because they are all in scheduled classes and it wouldn't necessarily work out that they could be on campus every day and following their schedule. You can't just do that for some kids because an EL kid, uh, it, it, they're not necessarily going to have the same schedule at the secondary level. That's, Supports, yeah, yes. It's different for the, for the students of English yeah. learners versus the students who are not necessarily going to full schedule classes, or even if they are, maybe they're in on the other days to do all of their goal work that is separate from the full inclusionary. I'm, I'm, I'm asking that we offer, we don't offer the same thing to everyone and that we do look at being more equitable in our offering uh, for the rest of the year, especially since we know that we're in the orange tier and we're, our case rates are declining and have continued to decline. So I'm not hearing a second for your motion. Eric, are you making a formal motion? I think because this is a consensus item, it wouldn't be a motion. It would be everybody can give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. I'm all for, <laughs> yeah, I'm all for having- that way. Students that need more assistance get the assistance and giving direction to Dr. Vitali and Dr. Lovey to look at ways to expand the in-person instruction for our high needs students. I, I, I can't tell you what that's gonna look like. I think they have to really examine, you know, some of those obstacles in place. But I think, I, I agree that they need more support, definitely. And I'm happy to hear that the preschool is moving forward with expanding the in-person learning for preschool students. And uh, anybody else want to weigh in? I just I want to clarify though, are you asking for them to move forward and to look into this or is it to just vote on it and to say, hey, we want to automatically just give them more than just the two intervention teachers that they currently have. So I, I think I need clarity on that. I think I'm a little confused and lost on that part of it so i understand yeah there's because remember this is it's late <laughs> we, from my perspective as eric had said earlier on one of the items i don't have enough information to vote on that as an absolute direction or mandate tonight so i, I mean i don't mind the direction to staff to look into that um but i'm not mandating that they do it because we don't have enough information we're shooting from our hip here we don't have the constraints we don't know the dollars um of that issue I, I appreciate the goal and the direction i mean i want i want everybody back too um you know um we're, we're we're dodging the elephant in the room which is the core question and um we we, we probably need to get onto that one on the elementary yeah. what are we going to do what direction well i would like to make a motion <laughs> so yeah you got the chair well i'm going to make a motion that we maintain our current in-person elementary school schedule until the district has consulted with the county public health department to ensure the safety of our classroom environment as well as survey our parents and report back to the board would you include 
um, staff having discussions with OTA too about the practicality of this too as well? That's a this given. period of time? That, I, that is a given. Okay, well, I want to make sure that. I think the court would want to hear that that's a given too or not. They, they wouldn't know that. So I want to clarify that. Okay. So I can, I can make that motion one more time, but let's try this. I make a motion that we maintain our current sure. in-person elementary schedule until the district has consulted with the county public health department to ensure the safety of our classroom environments, continue negotiations with our labor partners and survey our families and report back to us at our next board meeting. Could we add an amendment stating that as we make progress towards school opening or something to that effect? I, I will accept a friendly amendment. What's what? I know, I, I need some clarity on that, Eleanor. Okay, um, since uh, um, Trustee Blessing brought it up about the courts, one of the things that um, has been man it's been discussed is that um, we are demonstrating that we are making progress towards full enrollment. So perhaps with um, including that statement, that does cover that. And I believe that we are moving towards phasing more into expanding our in-person with our elementary, with our preschool program that's happening. We're also looking at ways to provide more interventions to our students that need it most. And we've talked about that already. So we right. are expand, We are continuing to move towards our phase. I don't have enough information to be able to make that decision tonight. So I would like the district to go out and consult with the County Public Health Department as well as survey our parents. They've asked for that. Okay, well, I can accept the request for the data on that. I, I'm gonna need clarification on what you want me to ask parents so that you're, it sounds like you want to take action based on what the majority of parents respond. So what I'm going to need clarification on what you're going to want me to ask, but you, you need a second and then you can vote or however you want to do that. But okay. I would like for more clarification um, so that, so that you get the answers to the questions you're looking for, if that's what you intend to take action on. Okay, well, I don't. I don't have a second yet. Go, go, go ahead and talk. Go ahead. No, no, I'm looking for a second on my motion that I made. I don't think I can speak to it until there's a second, or unless it dies. Okay. I okay, think. Is it, can I get a clarification? Oh, sorry. Sorry. It's all right. It's late. Raquel, we have a second. Yes, we have no. a second. Raquel seconded. Okay. okay, so I'll speak to. Yeah, yeah, I'll speak to Mike. Um, thoughts on the motion. Uh, so at our last meeting, uh, we talked at length and even in the meeting before about how the situation is changing quickly. We knew it would be changing quickly. And we saw, uh, especially at our last meeting, the, the case rates and the cases and the hospitalizations and the effect that it's having on communities, all of those impacts uh, dropping. And so I was, I, I thought at our last meeting that we were really clear that if the conditions were available for us to move to getting our students back into more instruction that we were going to do so. That's, that's why I thought we didn't call a special board meeting in between this meeting and the last meeting, even though we dropped into the red and then we precipitously dropped into the orange. Um, I was trying to remain as patient as possible for this meeting because I knew that we would be coming up with we'd be in the celebration of the, the orange tier of case rates bottoming out again we might be in the yellow tier in just a couple of weeks it's very likely um, so i'm speaking against the motion because I, I made a commitment that when the science showed that it is the time to take action and to get students back in the classroom that i, that I think that i know that it's the right thing to do to move ahead and if if we can't come to a consensus with our, our bargaining teams, then we need to create conditions to which that they can come to a consensus on. That's 
I think we need to be making an actionable move tonight, given the, the, the state of the virus. And that's what's been, always been holding us back. The lawsuit is a lawsuit. This is what I'm focused on. The conditions now are very low spread. Um, I understand that it's really concerning to have a lot of students in. I think we need to be as creative as possible to keep those students with their teachers, to open up any multi-purpose room spaces, to employ any teachers that we had. We hired 32 or 36 intervention teachers. 30. 30. So they are credentialed teachers that are on our campuses already. Um, for the next two weeks, they can be building that rapport, getting the data from their teachers. It is definitely not ideal. But we're in a situation that, you know, I, I really feel for teachers making transitions as I've had to make one this week too. It's awful. And it's terrible that we have to ask you to do this, but we're looking at, you know, possibly an 80 hour difference in instruction. If we, if we have lunch on campus, which we haven't even kind of covered in this conversation, which I know has been a, is a tricky spot, but if we can get the kids out and spread across campus, doing outdoor picnic lunches with plenty of space, then we're looking at even more than that. Um, those hours are, uh, now they're attainable. And so that's why I'm speaking against the motion today. And all of that takes time. I, that all of that is going to take some time to do. What you, what you said makes exact. Anyways, I agree with what you said. I just think it takes time. There, part of my motion was that they continue to work with our labor partners to come up with those creative solutions to be able to bring the students back more in person on our campuses, but do it safely. So to speak to the time that you bring up, I mean, that's why last meeting we, were, we talked and annoyingly so that we need to be ready to make a fast shift at this meeting. Um, and. It, and the other piece about time is that if we stall this out now, like you said, like right now we're gonna get six weeks of it back. But if we push it out another two weeks, four weeks starts to look less appetizing to ask for a, for a transition. And then it looks even worse after that. So I don't know that there's going to be a time that makes more sense than now. I, I can't think of one. I, we have been very patient all year long, despite a very loud and vocal, um, small group of parents and, and we continue to focus in on what's important the safety and the conditions that we have to deal with and and so I don't know, you know, go on. The, there were two things i neglected to say i didn't actually give you a timeline i apologize for that um, we believe that we could conduct those uh, negotiations and have the 10 days uh, notification uh, per our mou um, and the notification to families to be able to make the transitions that they would make uh, by the week of May 3rd. Um, and also, I don't want to... Um, uh, I don't want to... I don't want to limit what those negotiations uh, might entail. So if uh, as part of the negotiations, the three foot distance was, is a deal breaker for the board, then the bargaining teams would need to come up with a situation perhaps that didn't have that. So right now we have Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, um, AM, PM, half the class. And so if you know, the recommendation is to return on a five day a week modified schedule, um, so that those negotiation teams would need to come up with what would that Wednesday look like then? And we have a lot of factors in place, right? We know that we have our MOU in place. We know that we have our contract in place. Um, and the negotiating teams know what all those factors are. And so we would put it to them to come up with a schedule that would increase the in-person time, meet the five-day modified schedule, and maintain, if that is, is a priority, um, which it is for all of us, um, even though it's a recommendation, that three foot distancing, then those could be the parameters that we could um, have the negotiation teams uh, deal with. Consent. I don't think anything in that in your motion, Stacey, prevents that discussion from happening tomorrow, does it? From your perspective, Stacey? No, nothing. I, I want us to no, open for in-person like instruction. <laughs> So the way yeah. I'm interpreting this, if it's voted on this way, is that we maintain our current um, 
schedule until we can consult CDPH. So I'm guessing if CDPH says that that is a three foot recommendation, you can come back, continue to, neg to negotiate, um, which we have on the schedule and then survey parents. And that's the piece where I would need more direction. So if I can initiate a survey as soon as tomorrow with the questions that the board would want me to ask, and we gave them a couple of days, if the majority of the parents who take that survey then want, I mean, are we gonna ask them, do they want full time? Are we gonna ask them, like that's what I would need are, some more uh, direction. Are you comfortable on. having your kid in a classroom without the highly recommended three foot distancing? Do you need after school care? Do you need before school care, right? Though I heard Raquel say a couple of those items. Um, yeah, wait, wait, hang on hang on one second though, Stacey. And I, wanna, I should have said this earlier on the like, survey because on the five-day model, Julie, are we talking about what's the day? What I mean, what would you speculate might be one of the one of the? How long is the day? Is it is it eight to five, eight to three, eight to two, eight to one? Um, you know, in one sense, why do we ask parents about you know after school care when we may be going to school from nine to three? And that's like an academic question because that's a better situation than they've had all year. And they're gonna, you know, even though we can't give them full aftercare, we got them there from nine to three. We've expanded the time in the schoolyard in the school day significantly. I mean, is that is that relevant, Julie, or is that not relevant? Because because the survey seems to me like something that's not going to be useful. Um, but if we got to do the survey, then do it, and you figure out how to get the questions answered. But um, I think it's I don't think it gives us anything that we don't in our gut know. Parents want to be there. Like, yes, they love to be there after school. Yes, they love to have before school. If we can provide it, we'll do it. If we can't, we can't, you know? But we're just talking about coming in more hours with this distance issue as, as practical as the judge has directed us, as the state law directs us to try and service as maximum feasible, maximum being feasible, I guess. Greatest extent possible as practicable. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. The way that I think I can mostly answer that question, Mike, is that we have been able uh, to accommodate the, I'm not going to say all, uh, requests in our uh, elementary program and our secondary program for uh, after school and before school and whatever hours, depending on what schedule we were in. And we've also been able to accommodate uh, parents, request, parents and guardians uh, requests as things have shifted. So I've, as we've shifted schedules, if they wanted to stay in a full remote model, we've been able to accommodate that. As, as people have wanted to come off of that remote model and go back to school, we've been able to accommodate that. Um, and staff, all staff has been working tirelessly to try and accommodate um, the needs of our families. And we haven't been able to accommodate everyone and that's been unfortunate. And, um, but with the, with the way this, that the situation is, um, people have varying needs, um, but we've been able to accommodate the majority of people. So I would expect with this next shift that we would be able to do the same thing. And that's why I think the survey isn't really gonna be beneficial per se, but. Is that a motion, Mike, for an amendment? Or do we, do we ask parents, do you wanna change your schedule? Do you want to change your elementary schedule right now? Sure. Yeah, I don't know. You want to ask? I that. mean, yeah. seriously, I mean, that's 50, the question. 50, do you want to? Yeah, do you gets, want to? Yeah. If we get 50 50, what do you do with it? You know? Well, that's how it if you is. Get, you right got to say to add more days. If you, you're going to have to say to add more time or something because that's the purpose of it is to add more class time, right? I was trying to figure out, out a there. way <laughs> to address the parents yeah. that came on during public comment and some of the. Other public comments that say we haven't reached out to our family since last June. So I heard that. And that yeah, I heard that. And you know, it's hard to go back and fix it, but <laughs> do we do we communicate right. with them and what do we ask? I'm not the expert on that. I just right. feel like we Neither don't have I, enough but... information. And we are expanding to the greatest extent possible as practicable. And then we're also providing summer school opportunities and the bridge opportunities. So this in-person instruction is going to continue throughout this, throughout the summer, which we haven't had before, except for our ELL students. So we are 
continuing to expand our in-person instruction opportunities for our students. I think I need a clarification review. Under staff recommendation, elementary return five days a week on a modified schedule. Did we actually set the dates and the hours? I know Trustee Blessing asked that question. So we, the, we would negotiate what that schedule would look like. Um, okay. So we did not define that. So it could be that Wednesday is also an AM PM model. Uh, again, there's a lot of factors, so it might not mirror what Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday look like, but that could certainly be an option. Um, and then we think based on all the things that need to take place between now and a, a possible time for opening, the timeline would be May 3rd, that we would, that we believe that we could get everything in place that needs to be uh, in place. And it's not due to lack of planning. It's not due to um, anything other than the time for the transitions to take place, if that makes sense. There's a lot of moving parts that most typical parents don't understand with a school district of this size, making this, this pivot to this phase of in-person instruction that we have to work through. Agreed, agreed. So I have a first and second for my motion and you know, it's 10 17. So I, I just- have a clar clarifying question. So this survey is for information only so that we can better provide whatever transition we need to provide. And that's for resources. It's not a determining factor. I, I don't think we've shifted anything based on majority rule. Right, no, that's true. Yeah, okay, I can, I can get there. I was just trying to respond to a need that we haven't reached out to yeah. our parents. I, we've been accused of ignoring it. parents, which I find insulting, but I am Understood. a parent. I just don't want it to be a, I don't want it to be a big time impediment to good negotiations between staff and, the, and our teachers. That's Agreed. all, that's the main thing. So Julie, if you can figure out the questions with the, board president and we would go that way if this motion carries. So what is the difference between the motion and elementary return to five days? Mine is, um, my motion was that we maintain our current in-person elementary schedule, which is four days a week until the district has consulted with CDPH, you know, CP, Oh my gosh, I'm losing my mind. <laughs> yeah, to ensure the safety of our classroom environment, continue to work with our labor partners and survey our parents and then report back to the board. This would give us more information about coming back and making sure we have that balance of safety and instruction that we've been really diligent about this whole entire time. So just for clarity's yep. sake, would we need the San Diego Department of Public Health to say yes to reopening for further instruction anyway? I'm not sure. Probably should include them. Isn't that what, uh, what was suggested? I put the well. county the, public the, health department. The yeah. I thought it was the county department of public health. <laughs> CDPH? The CDPH and the CDC recommendation is three feet apart. That's who you need to consult with. So, okay. Is that not right. possible? It, it, we're checking in with the county to see if our plans are, they give a green light to, that's the question? Uh, no, isn't the question, would uh, less than three feet be acceptable in some occasions? That's the question, right, Stacy? Yeah, and what occasions are those? Which teachers uh, are those that get stuck with the classes with the larger sizes? And which right, students so, are the ones that are moved into little spaces? There's a supervision issue here and total disruption to these students who've had these teachers all year long. I just, ugh. anyways, frustrated, clearly. 
Right again, but Stacy, there could be a scenario where we could negotiate a schedule that adds the fifth day and still keeps the class sizes at half. That would that that is a definite option. It is. I I haven't seen that option. You had that hasn't been presented to us because it's like you need more time. Negotiated, right. You need more time. And just for clarity's sake for everybody. If we went with the staff recommendation, we would continue to negotiate with OTA as well. Yes, okay. right. That's my understanding. And so no consultation with the county public health department. We could provide that. I, I mean, I, I think they're extremely responsive to requests. I think that could be folded right into their recommendation. I would actually be highly in support of that to hear that, to get their feedback on our plan for reopening five days in person. And that's all I asked for, so. So you would accept staff's recommendation on the, with the caveat that we consult with the county to get the green light on our reopening plan? And we stay in our current schedule that we're in right now until we have that information to expand our in-person instruction. We could get that information so that that could inform negotiations and that could happen as early as tomorrow. All right. And, then, and are we dropping the survey then? I, I'm not married to the survey, but it seemed to be a huge need that our families and <laughs> public comment also shared that no one's really reached out to them about another uh, schedule is, change. Uh, this is the fifth what? schedule change for elementary families to have to figure out transportation, supervision, et cetera. It's extremely inconvenient for some people. So, and we don't even know who was impacted by it or not because we haven't asked. And I, I know the board knows this, but those schedule changes weren't just um, random schedule changes. They were as a result I know you know, Stace, as a result to what was happening with the, the case rates. And when things spiked in uh, December, as I recall, that's when we went back to uh, full remote instruction and waited until March to come back when the uh, case rates went down. And, and now they continue to go down. Which is and so, again, I think, and so that's why the recommendation is being made uh, the way it's being made. And again, I wanna reiterate that a fifth day doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be um, all kids in the class at the same time. It could be another version of what we have going on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday in the form of a split day. I still have a motion out there. Do you guys need me to repeat it so you guys can vote on it and then we can move forward? I'm sorry, I'm just, yeah, <laughs> we are, we're, we're talking around things. So I'm gonna make my motion again. My motion is that we maintain our current in-person elementary schedule until the district has consulted with the County Public Health Department to ensure the safety of our classroom environment, continue to negotiate with our labor groups and survey parents and report back to us. That's the motion with the second. Yes, that's the motion with the second. I uh, I feel that um, parents that said they would, they weren't saying they wanted a survey. They were saying they wanted the schools open okay. as soon as possible. Yeah, that's kind of my spot too, but um, I'm willing to concede it now. Staff can figure out how to do a quick survey and We'll get beat up over it either way anyway. So, you know. Well, I'm gonna call for the vote. So if we're done with discussion. Can I, so can I do a, uh, I offer a friendly amendment to split the survey with this current motion? So the survey is a separate motion. You want the survey as a separate motion? Yeah. That's fine. I can, I, I'll accept that friendly amendment. All right. Do we want to vote on the first part first? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Do you need me to read it again? I can <laughs> wrote it down. Oh, I don't know. Okay. Call. All in favor of supporting the motion that I made minus the survey. 
Aye. 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 No. One no. 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 Motion carries three, two. Now we'll go to the, your motion, Eric, that you made about the survey. Is that? Yep. So this would be a motion to survey parents to offer the best supports that we can through the remainder of the school year. Right, sorry, I'm trying to capture your motion for the survey. Let me, yeah. I, wanna, I, wanna, I wanna make clear here what that motion is because my intention is to vote against the survey. So is a yes vote against the survey or is it a no vote against <laughs> the survey? Please clarify. Julie, you can, I mean, uh, Stacey, so you I, can roll as the chair. I think I, Eric, let me get this right. Eric is making a motion that no. we so I, survey the parents, right? Sorry, I, 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 just, I just made a motion to split the, the original. So whatever okay. the survey idea is now it can be considered right. separately. Okay. That's all I was thinking. Okay. And we don't have okay. to make a motion then, on the survey. We can just provide direction to Julie and her team about communicating with parents. No. Let's take a vote. You want to take a vote okay. on it? May I make a, um, take a vote on the survey? When we look at surveys, seriously, only about a third, people, a third of people are going to respond. And we know those folks who do respond are the ones who spoke tonight. So, you know, right. we're asking staff to do something that's kind of redundant, more work on their plate. It's, take, it's taking time energy and creativity away from our um, desire to open the schools as soon as possible. You know, it's something that's ancillary out there. We know what the response is gonna be. We know really? who's gonna respond. We need to focus on getting our schools open as soon as possible with all energy directed towards that. Anyhow, I'll, call for the right. I'll call for the question on the survey. <clears throat> Stacy, will you make the make the ask? Do you, do you want me to make a motion on it? I, I I'll no, make no, a motion. Gonna, I, no, the, no, the chair I'm, just call call for the vote. I'm sorry. I'll call for the vote. The all call those vote. in favor, all those in favor of having a survey for our parents about our in-person instruction, say aye. I'm the only one I think aye. All those not in all favor. Okay. Well, it doesn't look like you have to have a survey then. There we so go. I, I need you. to ask, I need to ask for some clarification. So the way I understood the motion that you made and voted on and uh, <laughs> right. No, I'm sorry. The one that you made Stacy about maintaining yeah. uh, the current schedule um, and mm -hmm until we consult the CDPH to see uh, the specific issues about the three foot distancing and that we continue negotiations. So, I mean, that can all be done as early as tomorrow. So am I bringing back a recommendation not until the May meeting? Are we making those adjustments? So if the CDPH says, no, you, it's a recommendation, you can do two feet, you can do one feet, and then we go right into negotiations with that information and then make the pivot as we've done before, as the new schedule was uh, put out for ratification. I or think you I need to bring it to the board, whatever the CDPH and whatever comes out with negotiations needs to come to the board. So I'm not bringing back a recommendation to the board until May? Uh, no, no, we could do it sooner if it's done sooner. When you're We're ready, for ready a, Julie, fast a board be, meeting. Bring to yeah. us in session and we'll do it. Okay. So as soon as we can get that done, I can bring that back to you because we can we can get yes. I, I would I would imagine we can get the CDPH information um, pretty quick. That question answered pretty quick. But it's but it's not the CDPH though, that's the state. Uh yeah, the state. You're right. You, you, you said the county health. Yes. Sorry, my apologies. County Department of Public Health. Yes, what bring it I back saying? as quick as bring it back as soon as you get a consensus with a path with this. So we might have to have another board meeting, and it'll be a short one because this will be the only thing on the agenda. So the next 
The next recommendation is secondary. Julie, do you want to go over your recommendation so we can vote on that? To stay consistent with the current model that we have in place. So move. I'll second. Only comment is that we continue to expand specialized services to the greatest greatest extent possible for all special ed learners. Okay, I'll call for the vote. All in favor of the recommendation for secondary to remain? Aye. 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 Motion carries. All right, we still have more stuff on our agenda. So I don't know if we can move off this topic. I'm looking at my fellow board members. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the robust discussion. I appreciate this. All right, so we're moving on to, I'm looking. Oh, we have, we have several items to vote on. So we have item 8B, a public hearing on the Williams Settlement legislation. So I'm gonna open the public hearing at 10.31 p.m. Do we have any public comments? No, we do not on this item. All right, I'm going to close the public hearing at 10.31 p.m. We're gonna move on to item 8C, the adoption of resolution 30, 2020, 2021, Williams Settlement legislation determining sufficiency of instructional materials. Yes, thank you, board. This is a uh, acceptance that we have reviewed our instructional materials and textbooks and that we do have sufficient ones as outlined in the Williams Settlement of 2004. I have a question. Have we, we've received all the materials for English language arts in terms of the bookmark program? So yes, bench benchmark, I'm sorry, benchmark uh -huh. program so that we can begin, if it comes to that, for instance, in attendance to have um, testing, to use it as a pathway for us, our state requirements for testing. I know it's been wavered by the feds and by the states, but just in case, are we ready to go just in case in that area? Yes, we would actually use our iReady test at, uh, for our uh, younger students and at the high school, we actually are using uh, the SBAC this year uh, based on the leadership of our high school principals for our 11th graders. Uh, we have received our core materials from Benchmark and a number of the uh, supplemental uh, materials that we've ordered to address uh, potential learning gaps. Um, we've received, um, I'm not sure if we received all of those just yet because we did order them, but all of the core materials we've received for this entire year. Thank you. Thanks. So I'll make a motion to approve. Do I have a second? I second. All right, I have a first and a second. No further discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Raquel, did you vote? I said I. Okay, sorry. I just want to make sure. Five zero. All right. Our next item on the agenda is eight D approval to continue license agreement with Apex Learning 2021 2022 school year. Yes, uh, this is a licensure agreement with Apex Learning, which we have used for this year for our independent study. It also allows for credit recovery for our students in high school, and it is uh, approved for A through G. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Second. Okay. I have a first and a second. Any discussion? I'll call for the vote. All in favor of approval of item Aye. 8D? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. <laughs> All right, motion carries 5-0. Um, the next item, 8E, approval of use of OUSD graduation credit waivers form. Yes, uh, so this item uh, reflects state law that we're allowed to use uh, to allow students to 
graduate with a high school diploma with fewer than the 220 credits that are in our district to go to the state standard, which is 130 credits. Currently, we use this process for our homeless, foster youth, and military-connected students. This would allow us to expand this to all the students who have been impacted by COVID-19. It does not allow for a waiver of the core academics, but rather electives, and allows students to have the opportunity to graduate on time. This will not be used um, until we've exhausted all intervention and opportunities through APEX and summer programming and things like that, but we want to make sure that we do have this as an option. There will be very few students who would need all of the, uh, the 90 units change or the 90 credits changed. It might just even be a waiver of one course um, that they might just be slightly short of. I'll make a motion to adopt that. I'll second that. I think that. it's excellent. I'll second that. All right, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Dr. Levy. So now we're moving on to item yeah, nine. Question. Did we have a question? Sorry. No, sorry. <laughs> it's OK. All right. We're moving on to item nine personnel. 9A, um, we have a public hearing for proposed reopeners for the 2021-2022 school year. I'm opening the hearing at 10.36 p.m. Do we have any public comments, Anne? Yes, Todd Madison. All right, hi, Todd. Hi. You're up, hi. you know the rules, three minutes. I do, all right, hi. thank you very much. Um, there you go. Thanks. So tonight, I thought I would ask some questions of the board and district relating to the reopening of negotiations. So first of all, is the board aware of the fact that the second interim budget showed a deficit of $9 million this year, rising to $19.9 million ahead? Is the board aware of the fact that this deficit spending has generally been the rule since 2017, when the district first dropped into qualified budget status? Is the board aware of the fact that this means there's, there's no way to increase costs without creating a need to cut from our kids? Is the board also aware of the fact that in 2019, full-time certificated employees had a median total pay of $91,000 with median total compensation of $120,000? Is the board aware of the fact that the Census Bureau and the Department of Ed numbers show our certificated employees make almost $31,000 a year more in total compensation than comparably educated county residents? Is the board, does the board understand what a Me Too raise is and how questionable the ethics around that are? Do they know that any increase negotiated will be applied to administrative staff, a group with a median total compensation of $158,000 a year? Is the board aware of the fact that OUSD has no turnover problems anywhere and that the district has no idea why any employees leave because they don't ask? Is the board aware of the fact that the district has never done a salary survey of wages in our area so they have no idea how pay rates compare? Lastly, is the board aware of all the great things that could be funded for our kids with money that instead gets used for extra raises for employees over and over again? We see in the reopeners the intent is to provide fair and equitable compensation competitive in the market. From the actual data, we can already do that. We're done. That should make the negotiations quick. The idea that our staff is underpaid and ready to leave at the drop of a hat is simply not true. Both are just mis not just misunderstandings, but outright falsehoods, because the people who say this actually do know the data, but choose to ignore it because it serves their interests. I would suggest the board take its financial oversight responsibility seriously and pay attention to the data when negotiating new agreements. Let me be clear. I think our staff is great. I think they're second to none. I think they should be paired fairly. I'm fine with existing pay rates and raise schedules. What I'm not fine with is cutting from our kids to support pay and increase rates substantially higher than comparable in our area. A few years ago, I was asked by asked, I was asked where parents were in these negotiations. I asked where parents were in these negotiations. We're paying the bills. We're the ones that kids are hurt by cuts. I was told by a board member that he was my representative in this. It's true, however, I have to note that during the last election, there were zero contributions disclosed to his campaign by parents, contrasting with 6,000 spent on his behalf by the union. I'd suggest all our boards start actually representing parents in these negotiations, not their campaign contributors. Let's do something different this time. Let's put our kids' interests first, not our district's interests. Thanks. And do we have any more public comment? Not on this side, All right, I'm going to close the public hearing at 10.40 p.m.
We're gonna move on to item 9B, proposed reopener by the Oceanside Teachers Association to negotiate with the Oceanside Unified School District for the 2021-2022 school year. Hi, Dr. Began and board members. This is just the board's uh, receipt of the negotiations proposal known as Sunshine Letters to the district from OTA to the district. All right, so do we have any questions? This is standard. All right, I'll make a motion to approve. Do I have a second? Second. second. All right, I have a first and a second. All in favor of accepting Aye. the proposed reopen? Aye. 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 We have four. Eric, did you weigh in? Aye. Okay. Motion yeah. carries 5 0. Thank you. I know it's getting late. 9 C, proposed reopener by the Oceanside Unified School District to negotiate with the Oceanside Teachers Association for the 2021 2022 school year. Right. And this is the district's letter to ODA to engage in negotiations for next year's master contract. Thank you. All right. I'll make a motion to approve. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, first and second. All in favor of accepting? Say aye. 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 Motion carries 5 0. Got two more, guys. 9 D, proposed reopener by the California School Employees Association and its Chapter 370 to negotiate with the Oceanside Unified School District for the 2021 2022 school year. I'll make a motion. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Motion carries 5 0. One more. 9 E. Proposed reopener for the Oceanside Unified School District to negotiate with California School Employees Association and its Chapter 370 for the 2021 2022 school year. Second. All right. We have first and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries for hey. 5-0. Uh -oh. Uh oh all right. Oh, we got one more, sorry, I was on a different page. <laughs> 9F, adoption of resolution number 32 for the 2021, reduction of classified positions and hours due to district reorganization. Right, last year the district made a decision for reorganizing the ARC program. Uh, and so this um, is the effect of that with our classified employees. And since that time, we've worked hard and met with all the employees to do replacement. We've successfully managed to uh, find positions for all of the classified ARC positions except for one. There is one layoff due to an employee being hired only in that position and they had no job rights to any other positions to go back into. So we did meet with them and explain that it's a layoff from that position. However, they're welcome to apply to other openings, which we have in the district. They would just need to go through our application process. Um, and that's been explained to that one employee. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. I have a quick question on that. Does that, um, with everybody that moved and transitioned over, does did they stay basically with the same amount of hours or did they lose because of it? As much as we could match them, uh, we put them into either the same or as similar positions as possible. There were some that had reduction in pay due to difference in hours. All right, but no further discussion. All in favor of item 9F? Aye. 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 Raquel? Aye. Aye, sorry, I didn't hear you on mute. All right, motion carries 5-0. Now we're moving on to item 11, business. Item 11A, acceptance of independent audit report for 2019-2020. Thank you, President Begin. The California Education Code section requires that an independent audit be conducted annually for all school districts. The audit report is designed to provide citizens, taxpayers, students, investors, and creditors with a general overview of the district's finances and to show the district's accountability for the money it receives. After the final audit report is presented to the Board of Education for review, it will be submitted to the County Office of Education. It is recommended that the Board of Education accept the 2019-2020 independent audit report. 
I'll make a motion to. I'll second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, do we have a choice? Oh, what do you mean? You can vote no, yes. Do you do you have questions? Sorry. Um, we already we have this huge deficit. Um with the audit and legally report. we have to um I guess submit this, correct? Mm -hmm. okay. Right. The audit just oh, goes through and makes sure that we're doing everything according to code. Um, to our ed code and then we report it out to you and let you know if there's anything um, that you should be concerned about or if there's any findings. So the board was sent the report um, a few weeks back and had a chance to review it then. Yeah, I reviewed it okay. several times. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I guess I'll support. Since it's All right. Sorry to rush you. I didn't mean to do that, Eleanor. I apologize. Well, no, you didn't rush me. It's just that it's We'll talk later, but I'm not $9 million. Is a, Eleanor, to be clear, all you're doing is accepting the audit report. You're, you're not approving any expenditures or disapproving of any, um, um, I can't think. Um, I understand. I understand. Of any deficit. You're not agreeing with it. Sorry. You're, yeah, you're just, you're just acknowledging receipt of the report. Thank the you. The audit report said we conducted business in the way we were supposed to conduct our business with our numbers, independent of what the numbers were. It said we accurately reflected what the situation was and that's all it does. Thank all right. you. That motion carried 5-0. So we're moving on to item 11B, adopt resolution number 33, appoint members to the Measure W Citizens Bond Oversight Committee. Thank you, President Begin. Tonight, we are pleased to present eight members for our Measure W Citizens Bond Oversight Committee, also known as Measure W CBOC. The following Oceanside community members have volunteered to serve on the CBOC in the following roles. We have Haley Wansley. She's an active member of an Oceanside business organization. Robbie Calderon-Haas, active member in a senior citizens organization. Robert Camo Gleesberg, active member in a bona fide taxpayers association. Melissa Campbell and Melissa Johnson, our parent, guardian, or caregiver of a current OUSD student. Jessica Strick is a parent, guardian, caregiver of an OUSD student and an active member in a parent teacher organization. Then we have Gigi Gleason and Donald Gordon, who are community members. The district staff solicited applicants for at least seven positions on the on the committee by posting information and applications for interested members. Um, we did that on the district website. Uh, we received eight applications and we do recommend all applications as members to serve on the committee. It is recommended that the Board of Education adopt resolution 33 to authorize the appointment of the members to the Measure W Citizens Bond Oversight Committee. I'll make a motion to approve. Thank you to those eight people okay. for volunteering. I, I'll second that. Thank you, um, folks, for volunteering. All right, all Absolutely. in favor? Absolutely, thank you. Aye. 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 All right, Aye. thank you. We're getting punchy here. We're almost done, guys. We got this. All right, item 12, <laughs> policy development. 12A, approval of updates to board bylaw 9010 public statements. Yes, yeah, so this is an update uh, from CSBA and I want to make it clear with the board that the uh, language is verbatim based on the California School Board Association uh, recommendation. Staff did not make any uh, changes to the recommendations made by CSBA. Uh, the board, of course, has the, the right to make any changes to these policies, but I just want it to be clear that staff didn't write these, staff didn't create these, staff didn't modify these in any way. These are uh, as, as put forward by CSBA. I'd like to um, make a motion for an amendment to strike the last sentence of the first paragraph from the recommendation. I think it is redundant upon, like it, it basically asks us to follow our own protocols, which is why we have protocols. And I also <laughs> think it, it, it sets up a, I think it, it, tr it tries to be overly intimidating of making uh, personal comments. And, and I think we are all very clear that when we speak outside, we are not speaking for the poor, we are speaking for ourselves. 
I just don't think it's necessary. I have to kind of agree because it's kind of vague, misleading, confusing. So a yeah. little bit of all that. So we have public comment as well. I'm not sure if you guys want to hear it first. I noticed that. Yes, can we have public comment first? Yeah, Please. I'm sorry, it's, it's getting late. Todd, thanks for hanging in with us. Todd, would you like to get started? Oh, this, this is easy. I just second Eric. Uh, that's all I was gonna point out is that it just seems like you're limiting your ability to agree or disagree um, with the board in ways to promote the board's ability to govern the district. It just seems like you wouldn't want to, um, to do that to yourself. But um, so that's the extent of my public comment. Thank you. No problem. Thanks for hanging in there. I'm not tracking or I needed you to read that again, Eric. Maybe I don't have it in front of me, actually. I'm, I got let, one. I got let me read policy. it so I can be clear that I'm Thank that I'm understanding Eric. Um, my brain stopped yeah. Yeah. one minute ago. I didn't even realize we were here. <laughs> uh, uh, so on the 9010 uh, be the public statements, Eric, where it starts on however, uh, all the way to protocols, strike that part out. Right. Okay, got it. Uh, so that's the, did, you made that as a motion? Yes, I said. Okay. So Eric, uh, do you, do you see that, Mike? So no, on I, the, I didn't print that. Yes, but, um, um, it, it removes a redundant you, remark. Staff have any? No, staff has no issue with that at all. Zero. Okay. I, right. I agree that it makes cool. a, a redundant statement. All right. We have a first and second to amend it. All in favor? Redundant, do we? <laughs> oh no, we're not that. All in favor of supporting that amendment? Aye. 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 All right, guys, stay with me. We're almost there. All right, item 12B approval of updates to board bylaw 9100 organization. Yeah, same process as before updates from CSBA verbatim. Does anybody have any modifications to this? No. Nope. Move approval. Right. I'll second. All in favor of approving Aye. this update? Aye. 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 Motion. Aye. Motion carries 5 0. And then the next item is 13 public comments on non agenda items. And do we have anybody? She's looking. No, we, no, we do we not, don't. Stacey. We do not. Okay, so we're moving right on to item 14, board staff discussion, because we haven't had enough of that tonight. Um, does anybody <laughs> else have any thoughts or discussion items? Um, I, just make a, I would just on a first point of personal privilege should have said it earlier to uh, Mr. Madison um, that I did not receive any campaign contributions from anybody because I did not have a campaign committee when I ran, uh, contrary to what Todd had a campaign contribute committee and raised money from whomever across the community, which is his right to do. But I did not raise any money for my campaign for school board race. Other people may have raised money on my behalf, but I had no control or or any control of that whatsoever. So please clarify any statements you make in the future, Todd, about that fact. Thank you. All right, the, anybody no else? More. Yeah, the only thing I would wanna bring up is uh, we had, this year was our first year as a pilot program to have ethnic studies in both our high schools, which I'm really proud of the work that our team has done to get that going. So I would love an update in the next couple of meetings about our future and, and how we're planning on expanding and, and how it went. I know it's been a powerful tool for those students to see themselves in, in their own local programming. So if we could see that sometime before this summer, yeah, so we can know what we're going into. All right. Thanks. Unless I'm stepping over. Yeah, as soon as possible so that we can know what next year looks like, yeah. <laughs> All right, anybody else have any board discussions? I wanna say thank you to my board colleagues for the engaging robust conversations tonight. We all come from different perspectives and wear different hats and have different thoughts, but I like that we appreciate and listen to each other before we make decisions. So thank you. Well, we appreciate you and we appreciate the board. <laughs> yeah.
We love you. Yep. I yep. just Thank appreciate you. the staff for Thanks. hanging in there with us and yeah. this amazing data because, yeah. oh my gosh. Um, yeah. So, yeah, staff's been phenomenal. All right. And with that said, fast turnaround on our next meeting. Yeah, we'll, we're, we'll be talking. <laughs> All right. So, I, I'm. we are adjourned. Meeting's adjourned at 10.55 with 137 people on. Thank you for hanging in with us. Wow. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night, all. Good night.